Section zero of An Adventure. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Adventure by Charlotte Anne Elizabeth Moberly and Eleanor Jourdain. Preface It is a great venture to speak openly of a personal experience, and we only do so for the following reasons. First, we prefer that our story, which is known in part to some, should be wholly known as told by ourselves. Secondly, we have collected so much evidence on the subject that it is possible now to consider it as a whole. Thirdly, conditions are changing at Versailles, and in a short time facts which were unknown and circumstances which were unusual may soon become commonplaces and will lose their force as evidence that some curious psychological conditions must have been present either in ourselves or in the place. It is not our business to explain or to understand, nor do we pretend to understand, what happened to put us into communication with so many true facts which, nine years ago, no one could have told us of in their entirety. But in order that others may be able to judge fairly of all the circumstances, we have tried to record exactly what happened as simply and fully as possible. Elizabeth Morrison, Francis Lamont. Publisher's Note. The ladies whose adventure is described in these pages have for various reasons preferred not to disclose their real names, but the signatures appended to the preface are the only fictitious words in the book. The publishers guarantee that the authors have put down what happened to them as faithfully and accurately as was in their power. End of section zero. Read by Martha Weller, Champaign, Illinois, May 10th, 2023. Section one of An Adventure by Charlotte Anne Elizabeth Moberly and Eleanor Jourdain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter one. Visits to the Petit Trianon. Miss Morrison's account of the first visit to the Petit Trianon, August 1901. After some days of sightseeing in Paris, to which we were almost strangers, on an August afternoon, 1901, Miss Lamont and I went to Versailles. We had very hazy ideas as to where it was or what there was to be seen. Both of us thought it might prove to be a dull expedition. We went by train and walked through the rooms and galleries of the palace with interest, though we constantly regretted our inability through ignorance to feel properly the charm of the place. My knowledge of French history was limited to the very little I had learnt in the schoolroom, historical novels, and the first volume of Justin McCarthy's French Revolution. Over thirty years before, my brother had written a prize poem on Marie Antoinette, for whom at the time I had felt much enthusiasm. But the German occupation was chiefly in our minds, and Miss Lamont and I thought and spoke of it several times. We sat down in the Salle des Glaces, where a very sweet air was blowing in at the open windows over the flower beds below, and finding that there was time to spare, I suggested our going to the Petit Trianon. My sole knowledge of it was from a magazine article read as a girl, from which I received a general impression that it was a farmhouse where the queen had amused herself. Looking in Baedeker's map, we saw this sort of direction, and that there were two Trianons, and sat off. By not asking the way, we went an unnecessarily long way round, by the great flight of steps from the fountains, and down the central avenue as far as the head of the long pond. The weather had been very hot all the week, but on this day the sky was a little overcast and the sun shaded. There was a lively wind blowing, the woods were looking their best, and we both felt particularly vigorous. It was a most enjoyable walk. After reaching the beginning of the long water, we struck away to the right, down a woodland glade, until we came obliquely to the other water close to the building, which we rightly concluded to be the Grand Trianon. We passed it on our left hand, and came up a broad green drive perfectly deserted. If we had followed it, we should have come immediately to the Petit Trianon, but not knowing its position, we crossed the drive and went up a lane in front of us. 
I was surprised that Miss Lamont did not ask the way from a woman who was shaking a white cloth out of the window of a building at the corner of the lane, but followed, supposing that she knew where she was going to. Talking about England and mutual acquaintances there, we went up the lane and then made a sharp turn to the right past some buildings. We looked in at an open doorway and saw the end of a carved staircase, but as no one was about we did not like to go in. There were three paths in front of us, and as we saw two men a little ahead on the center one, we followed it and asked them the way. Afterwards, we spoke of them as gardeners, because we remembered a wheelbarrow of some kind close by and the look of a pointed spade, but they were really very dignified officials, dressed in long grayish-green coats with small three-cornered hats. They directed us straight on. We walked briskly forward, talking as before, but from the moment we left the lane, an extraordinary depression had come over me, which, in spite of every effort to shake off, steadily deepened. There seemed to be absolutely no reason for it. I was not at all tired and was becoming more interested in my surroundings. I was anxious that my companion should not discover the sudden gloom upon my spirits, which became quite overpowering on reaching the point where the path ended, being crossed by another right and left. In front of us was a wood, within which, and overshadowed by trees, was a light garden kiosk, circular, and like a small bandstand, by which a man was sitting. There was no green sward, but the ground was covered with rough grass and dead leaves as in a wood. The place was so shut in that we could not see beyond it. Everything suddenly looked unnatural, therefore unpleasant. Even the trees behind the building seemed to have become flat and lifeless, like a wood worked in tapestry. There were no effects of light and shade, and no wind stirred the trees. It was all intensely still. The man sitting close to the kiosk, who had on a cloak and a large shady hat, turned his head and looked at us. That was the culmination of my peculiar sensations, and I felt a moment of genuine alarm. The man's face was most repulsive, its expression odious. His complexion was very dark and rough. I said to Miss Lamont, which is our way, but thought, nothing will induce me to go to the left. It was a great relief at that moment to hear someone running up to us in breathless haste. Connecting the sound with the gardener's, I turned and ascertained that there was no one on the paths, either to the side or behind. But at almost the same moment, I suddenly perceived another man, quite close to us, behind and rather to the left hand, who had, apparently, just come either over or through the rock, or whatever it was, that shut out the view at the junction of the paths. The suddenness of his appearance was something of a shock. The second man was distinctly a gentleman. He was tall, with large dark eyes, and had crisp curling black hair under the same large sombrero hat. He was handsome, and the effect of the hair was to make him look like an old picture. His face was glowing red as through great exertion, as though he had come a long way. At first I thought he was sunburnt, but a second look satisfied me that the color was from heat, not sunburning. He had on a dark cloak wrapped across him like a scarf, one end flying out in his prodigious hurry. He looked greatly excited as he called out to us, Mesdames, Mesdames, or Madame, pronounced more as the other, Il ne faut, pronounced foot, pas passer par là. He then waved his arm and said with great animation, Par ici, cherchez la maison. I was so surprised at his eagerness that I looked up at him again, and to this he responded with a little backward movement and a most peculiar smile. Though I could not follow all he said, it was clear that he was determined that we should go to the right and not to the left. As this fell in with my own wish, I went instantly towards a little bridge on the right, and turning my head to join Miss Lamont in thanking him, found to my surprise that he was not there. But the running began again, and from the sound it was close beside us. Silently we passed over the small rustic bridge which crossed a tiny ravine, so close to us when on the bridge that we could have touched it with our right hands, a thread-like cascade fell from a height down a green, pretty bank, 
where ferns grew between stones. Where the little trickle of water went to, I did not see, but it gave me the impression that we were near other water, though I saw none. Beyond the little bridge, our pathway led under trees. It skirted a narrow meadow of long grass, bounded on the further side by trees, and very much overshadowed by trees growing in it. This gave the whole place a somber look, suggestive of dampness, and shut out the view of the house until we were close to it. The house was a square, solidly built, small country house, quite different from what I expected. The long windows looking north into the English garden, where we were, were shuttered. There was a terrace round the north and west sides of the house, and on the rough grass which grew quite up to the terrace and with her back to it, a lady was sitting, holding out a paper as though to look at it at arm's length. I supposed her to be sketching, and to have brought her own camp stool. It seemed as though she must be making a study of trees, for they grew close in front of her, and there seemed to be nothing else to sketch. She saw us, and when we passed close by on her left hand, she turned and looked full at us. It was not a young face, and, though rather pretty, it did not attract me. She had on a shady white hat perched on a good deal of fair hair that fluffed round her forehead. Her light summer dress was arranged on her shoulders in handkerchief fashion, and there was a little line of either green or gold near the edge of the handkerchief, which showed to me that it was over, not tucked into her bodice, which was cut low. Her dress was long-waisted, with a good deal of fullness in the skirt, which seemed to be short. I thought she was a tourist, but that her dress was old-fashioned and rather unusual, though people were wearing fichu bodices that summer. I looked straight at her, but some indescribable feeling made me turn away, annoyed at her being there. We went up the steps onto the terrace, my impression being that they led up direct from the English garden, but I was beginning to feel as though we were walking in a dream. The stillness and oppressiveness were so unnatural. Again I saw the lady, this time from behind, and noticed that her fichu was pale green. It was rather a relief to me that Miss Lamont did not propose to ask her whether we could enter the house from that side. We crossed the terrace to the southwest corner and looked over into the Cour d'Honneur, and then turned back, and seeing that one of the long windows overlooking the French garden was unshuttered, we were going towards it when we were interrupted. The terrace was prolonged at right angles in front of what seemed to be a second house. The door of it suddenly opened, and a young man stepped out onto the terrace, banging the door behind him. He had the jaunty manner of a footman, but no livery, and called to us, saying that the way into the house was by the Cour d'Honneur, and offered to show us the way round. He looked inquisitively amused as he walked by us down the French garden till we came to an entrance into the front drive. We came out sufficiently near the first lane we had been in to make me wonder why the garden officials had not directed us back instead of telling us to go forward. When we were in the front entrance hall, we were kept waiting for the arrival of a merry French wedding party. They walked arm in arm in a long procession round the rooms, and we were at the back, too far off from the guy to hear much of his story. We were very much interested and felt quite lively again. Coming out of the Cour d'Honneur, we took a little carriage which was standing there and drove back to the Hôtel des Réservoirs in Versailles, where we had tea. But we were neither of us inclined to talk and did not mention any of the events of the afternoon. After tea... We walked back to the station, looking on the way for the tennis court. On the way back to Paris, the setting sun at last burst out from under the clouds, bathing the distant Versailles woods in glowing light, Valerian standing out in front a mass of deep purple. Again and again the thought returned, was Marie Antoinette really much at Trianon? And did she see it for the last time, long before the fatal drive to Paris accompanied by the mob? For a whole week, we never alluded to that afternoon, nor did I think about it until I began writing a descriptive letter of our expeditions of the week before. As the scenes came back one by one, 
the same sensation of dreamy, unnatural oppression came over me so strongly that I stopped writing and said to Miss Lamont, Do you think that the Petit Trianon is haunted? Her answer was prompt. Yes, I do. I asked her where she felt it, and she said, In the garden where we met the two men, but not only there. She then described her feeling of depression and anxiety, which began at the same point as it did with me, and how she tried not to let me know it. Talking it over, we fully realized, for the first time, the theatrical appearance of the man who spoke to us, the inappropriateness of the wrapped cloak on a warm summer afternoon, the unaccountableness of his coming and going, the excited running which seemed to begin and end close to us, and yet always out of sight, and the extreme earnestness with which he desired us to go one way and not another. I said that the thought had crossed my mind that the two men were going to fight a duel, and that they were waiting until we were gone. Miss Lamont owned to having disliked the thought of passing the man of the kiosk. We did not speak again of the incident during my stay in Paris, though we visited the conciergerie prisons and the tombs of Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette at Saint-Denis, where all was clear and fresh and natural. Three months later, Miss Lamont came to stay with me, and on Sunday, November 10th, 1901, we returned to the subject, and I said, If we had known that a lady was sitting so near us sketching, it would have made all the difference, for we should have asked the way. She replied that she had seen no lady. I reminded her of the person sitting under the terrace, but Miss Lamont declared that there was no one there. I exclaimed that it was impossible that she should not have seen the individual, for we were walking side by side and went straight up to her, past her, and looked down upon her from the terrace. It was inconceivable to us both that she should not have seen the lady, but the fact was clear that Miss Lamont had not done so, though we had both been rather on the lookout for someone who would reassure us as to whether we were trespassing or not. Finding that we had a new element of mystery, and doubting how far we had seen any of the same things, we resolved to write down independent accounts of our expedition to Trianon, read up its history, and make every inquiry about the place. Miss Lamont returned to her school the same evening, and two days later I received from her a very interesting letter giving the result of her first inquiries. E.M. Miss Lamont's account of her first visit to the Petit Trianon in 1901. August 1901. In the summer of 1900, I stayed in Paris for the first time, and in the course of that summer took a flat and furnished it, intending to place a French lady there in charge of my elder schoolgirls. Paris was quite new to me, and beyond seeing the picture galleries and one or two churches, I made no expeditions except to shops, for the exhibition of 1900 was going on, and all my free time was spent in seeing it with my French friends. The next summer, however, 1901, when after several months at my school in England, I came back to Paris, it was to take the first opportunity possible of having a visitor to stay there, and I asked Miss Morrison to come with me. Miss Morrison suggested our seeing the historic part of Paris in something like chronological order, and I looked forward to seeing it practically for the first time with her. We decided to go to Versailles one day, though rather reluctantly, as we felt it was diverging from our plan to go there too soon. I did not know what to expect, as my ignorance of the place and its significance was extreme. So we looked up general directions in Baedeker and trusted to finding our way at the time. After spending some time in the palace, we went down by the terrace and struck to the right to find the Petit Trianon. We walked for some distance down a wooded alley and then came upon the buildings of the Grand Trianon, before which we did not delay. We went on in the direction of the Petit Trianon, but just before reaching what we knew afterwards to be the main entrance, I saw a gate leading to a path cut deep below the level of the ground above, and as the way was open and had the look of an entrance that was used, I said, Shall we try this path? It must lead to the house. And we followed it. To our right we saw some farm buildings looking empty and deserted. Implements, among others a plow, were lying about. We looked in, but saw no one. The impression was saddening, 
but it was not until we reached the crest of the rising ground where there was a garden that i began to feel as if we had lost our way and as if something were wrong there were two men there in official dress greenish in color with something in their hands it might have been a staff a wheelbarrow and some other gardening tools were near them they told us in answer to my inquiry to go straight on i remember repeating my question because they answered in a seemingly casual and mechanical way but only got the same answer in the same manner as we were standing there i saw to the right of us a detached solidly built cottage with stone steps at the door a woman and a girl were standing at the doorway and i particularly noticed their unusual dress both wore white kerchiefs tucked into the bodice and the girl's dress though she looked thirteen or fourteen only was down to her ankles the woman was passing a jug to the girl who wore a close white cap footnote the woman was standing on the steps bending slightly forward holding a jug in her hand the girl was looking up at her from below with her hands raised but nothing in them she might have been just going to take the jug or have just given it up her light brown hair escaped from under her cap i remember that both seemed to pause for an instant as in a tableau vivant but we passed on and i did not see the end end footnote following the directions of the two men we walked on but the path pointed out to us seemed to lead away from where we imagined the petit trianon to be and there was a feeling of depression and loneliness about the place i began to feel as if i were walking in my sleep the heavy dreaminess was oppressive at last we came upon a path crossing ours and saw in front of us a building consisting of some columns roofed in and set back in the trees seated on the steps was a man with a heavy black coat round his shoulders and wearing a slouch hat at that moment the eerie feeling which had begun in the garden culminated in a definite impression of something uncanny and fear-inspiring the man slowly turned his face which was marked by smallpox his complexion was very dark the expression was very evil and yet unseeing and though i did not feel that he was looking particularly at us i felt a repugnance to going past him but i did not wish to show the feeling which i thought was meaningless and we talked about the best way to turn and decided to go to the right suddenly we heard a man running behind us he shouted mesdames mesdames and when i turned he said in an accent that seemed to me unusual that our way lay in another direction il ne faut pronounced foot pas passer par là he then made a gesture adding par ici cherchez la maison though we were surprised to be addressed we were glad of the direction and i thanked him the man ran off with a curious smile on his face the running ceased as abruptly as it had begun not far from where we stood i remember that the man was young-looking with a florid complexion and rather long dark hair i do not remember the dress except that the material was dark and heavy and that the man wore buckled shoes we walked on crossing a small bridge that went across a green bank high on our right hand and shelving down below us as to a very small overshadowed pool of water glimmering some way off a tiny stream descended from above us so small as to seem to lose itself before reaching the little pool we then followed a narrow path till almost immediately we came upon the english garden front of the petit trianon the place was deserted but as we approached the terrace i remember drawing my skirt away with a feeling as though someone were near and i had to make room and then wondering why i did it while we were on the terrace a boy came out of the door of a second building which opened on it and i still have the sound in my ears of his slamming it behind him he directed us to go round to the other entrance and seeing us hesitate with the peculiar smile of suppressed mockery offered to show us the way we passed through the french garden part of which was walled in by trees the feeling of dreariness was very strong there and continued till we actually reached the front entrance to the petit trianon and looked round the rooms in the wake of a french wedding party afterwards we drove back to the rue des reservoirs the impression returned to me at intervals during the week that followed but i did not speak of it until miss morrison asked me if i thought the petit trianon was haunted and i said yes then too the inconsistency of the dress and behavior of the man with an august afternoon at versailles struck me we had only this one conversation about the two men nothing else passed between us in paris 
It was not till three months later, when I was staying with her, that Miss Morrison casually mentioned the lady and almost refused to believe that I had not seen her. How that happened was quite inexplicable to me, for I believed myself to be looking about on all sides, and it was not so much that I did not remember her as that I could have said no one was there. But as she said it, I remembered my impression at the moment of there being more people than I could see, though I did not tell her this. The same evening, November 10th, 1901, I returned to my school near London. Curiously enough, the next morning I had to give one of a set of lessons on the French Revolution for the higher certificate, and it struck me for the first time with great interest that the 10th of August had a special significance in French history, and that we had been at Trianon on the anniversary of the day. That evening, when I was preparing to write down my experiences, a French friend whose home was in Paris came into my room, and I asked her just on the chance if she knew any story about the haunting of the Petit Trianon. I had not mentioned our story to her before, nor indeed to anyone. She said directly that she remembered hearing from friends at Versailles that on a certain day in August Marie Antoinette is regularly seen sitting outside the garden front at the Petit Trianon with a light flapping hat and a pink dress. More than this, that the place, especially the farm, the garden, and the path by the water, are peopled with those who used to be with her there. In fact, that all the occupations and amusements reproduce themselves there for a day and a night. I then told her our story, and when I quoted the words that the man spoke to us and imitated as well as I could his accent, she immediately said that it was the Austrian pronunciation of French. I had privately thought that he spoke Old French. Immediately afterwards, I wrote and told this to Miss Morrison. Footnote. By old, I mean old or unusual forms, perhaps surviving in provincial French. End footnote. F. L. On receiving Miss Lamont's letter, I turned to my diary to see on what Saturday in August it was that we had visited Versailles and looked up the history to find out to what event she alluded. On August 10, 1792, the Tuileries was sacked. The royal family escaped in the early morning to the Hall of the Assembly, where they were penned up for many hours, hearing themselves practically dethroned, and within sound of the massacre of their servants and of the Swiss guards at the Tuileries. From the hall, the king and queen were taken to the temple. We wondered whether we had inadvertently entered within an act of the queen's memory when alive, and whether this explained our curious sensation of being completely shut in and oppressed. What more likely, we thought, than that during those hours in the hall of the assembly, or in the conciergerie, she had gone back in such vivid memory to other Augusts spent at Trianon, that some impress of it was imparted to the place? Some pictures which were shown to me proved that the outdoor dress of the gentlemen at court had been a large hat and cloak, and that the ladies wore long-waisted bodices, with full-gathered short skirts, fichus, and hats. I told the story to my brother, and we heartily agreed that, as a rule, such stories made no impression at all upon us, because we always believed that, if only the persons involved would take the trouble to investigate them thoroughly and honestly for themselves, they could be quite naturally explained. We agreed that such a story as ours had very little value without more proof of reality than it had, but that, as there were one or two interesting points in it, it would be best to sift the matter quietly, lest others should make more of them than they deserved. He suggested lightly and in fun that perhaps we had seen the queen as she thought of herself, and that it would be interesting to know whether the dress described was the one she had on at the time of her reverie, or whether it was one she recollected having worn at an earlier date. My brother also inquired whether we were quite sure that the last man we had seen, who came out of the side building, as well as the wedding party, were all real persons. I assured him with great amusement that we had not the smallest doubt as to the reality of them all. As Miss Lamont was going to Paris for the Christmas holidays, I wrote and asked her to take any opportunity she might have to see the place again and to make a plan of the paths and the buildings for the guidebooks spoke of the Temple de l'Amour and the Belvedere, and I thought one of them might prove to be our kiosk, E.M. Miss Lamont's account of her second visit to the Petit Trianon. 
January 1902. On January 2nd, 1902, I went for the second time to Versailles. It was a cold and wet day, but I was anxious not to be deterred by that, as it was likely to be my only possible day that winter. This time I drove straight to the Petit Trianon, passing the Grand Trianon. Here I could see the path up which we had walked in August. I went, however, to the regular entrance, thinking I would go at once to the Temple de l'Amour, even if I had time to go no further. To the right of the Cour d'Honneur was a door in the wall. It led to the Hameau de la Reine and to the gardens. I took this path and came to the Temple de l'Amour, which was not the building we had passed in the summer. There was, so far, none of the eerie feeling we had experienced in August. But, on crossing a bridge to go to the Hameau, the old feeling returned in full force. It was as if I had crossed a line and was suddenly in a circle of influence. To the left I saw a tract of park-like ground, the trees bare and very scanty. I noticed a cart being filled with sticks by two laborers, and thought I could go to them for directions if I lost my way. The men wore tunics and capes with pointed hoods of bright colors, a sort of terracotta red and deep blue. Footnote. One man wore red, the other blue. The colors were not mixed. End of footnote. I turned aside for an instant, not more, to look at the ammo, and when I looked back, men and cart were completely out of sight, and this surprised me, as I could see a long way in every direction. And though I had seen the men in the act of loading the cart with sticks, I could not see any trace of them on the ground, either at the time or afterwards. I did not, however, dwell upon any part of the incident, but went on to the Amo. The houses were all built near a sheet of water, and the old oppressive feeling of the last year was noticeable, especially under the balcony of the Maison de la Reine, and near a window in what I afterwards found to be the Lettrie. I really felt a great reluctance to go near the window or look in, and when I did so, I found it shuttered inside. Coming away from the Amo, I at last reached a building, which I knew from my plan to be the smaller Orangerie. Then, meaning to go to the Belvedere, I turned back by mistake into the park and found myself in a wood, so thick that though I had turned towards the Amo, I could not see it. Before I entered, I looked across an open space towards a belt of trees to the left of the Amo some way off, and noticed a man, cloaked like those we had seen before, slip swiftly through the line of trees. The smoothness of his movement attracted my attention. I was puzzling my way among the maze of paths in the wood when I heard a rustling behind me, which made me wonder why people in silk dresses came out on such a wet day. And I said to myself, just like French people, I turned sharply round to see who they were, but saw no one. And then, all in a moment, I had the same feeling as by the terrace in the summer, only in a much greater degree. It was as though I were closed in by a group of people who already filled the path, coming from behind and passing me. At one moment there seemed really no room for me. I heard some women's voices talking French and caught the words, Monsieur et Madame, said close to my ear. The crowd got scarce and drifted away, and then faint music, as of a band, not far off, was audible. It was playing very light music with a good deal of repetition in it. Both voices and music were diminished in tone, as in a phonograph, unnaturally. The pitch of the band was lower than usual. The sounds were intermittent, and once more I felt the swish of a dress close by me. I looked at the map which I had with me, but whenever I settled which path to take, I felt impelled to go by another. After turning backwards and forwards many times, I at last found myself back at the Orangerie and was overtaken by a gardener. Footnote. I thought this gardener did not look like a Frenchman. He had more the air of an Englishman. He had hair on his face, a grizzled beard, was large and loosely made. His height was very uncommon, and he seemed to be of immense strength. His arms were long and very muscular. I noticed that even through the sleeves of his jersey. End of footnote. I asked him where I should find the Queen's Grotto that had been mentioned in de Nolhoc's book, which I had procured while in Paris. He told me to follow the path I was on, 
and in answer to a question, said that I must pass the Belvedere, adding that it was quite impossible to find one's way about the park unless one had been brought up in the place, and so used to it that personne ne pourrait vous tromper. The expression specially impressed me because of the experience I had just had in the wood. He pointed out the way and left me. The path led past the Belvedere, which I took for granted was the building we had seen in August, for coming upon it from behind, all the water was hidden from me. I made my way from there to the French garden, without noticing the paths I took. On my return to Versailles, I made careful inquiries as to whether the band had been playing there that day, but was told that though it was the usual day of the week, it had not played because it had played the day before, being New Year's Day. I told my French friends of my walk, and they said that there was a tradition of Marie Antoinette having been seen making butter within the laiterie, and for that reason it was shuttered. A second tradition they mentioned interested me very much. It was that on October 5th, 1789, which was the last day on which Marie Antoinette went to the Trianon, she was sitting there in her grotto and saw a page running towards her, bringing the letter from the minister at the palace to say that the mob from Paris would be at the gates in an hour's time. The story went on that she impulsively proposed walking straight back to the palace by the shortcut through the trees. He would not allow it, but begged her to go to the maison to wait whilst he fetched the carriage by which she was generally conveyed back through the park and that he ran off to order it. F. L. January 1902 1902 to 1904. During the next two years, very little occurred to throw light on the story. The person living in Versailles, to whom we had been directed, as having related the tradition of the Queen's being at Trianon on October 5, 1789, was unable to remember anything at all about it. The photographs of the Belvedere made it clear that it was not identical with the kiosk. On the many occasions on which Miss Lamont went to the Trianon, she could never again find the places, not even the wood, in which she had been. She assured me that the place was entirely different, the distances were much less than we had imagined, and the ground was so bare that the house and the amo were in full view of one another, and that there was nothing unnatural about the trees. Miss Lamont brought back from Paris La Reine Marie Antoinette by Monsieur de Nolhac, and Le Petit Trianon by Desjardins. We noted that Monsieur de Nolhac related the traditional story of the Queen's visit, and that the Comte de Vaudreuil, who betrayed the Queen by inciting her to the fatal acting of the Barbier de Seville in her own theatre at Trianon, was a creole and marked by smallpox, pages 61 and 212. Turning over the pages of Desjardins, I found Wertmüller's portrait of the Queen, and exclaimed that it was the first of all the pictures I had seen which had all brought back the face of the lady. Some weeks later I found this passage. Ce tableau fut assez mal accueilli des critiques contemporains qui le trouvèrent froid, sans majesté, sans grâce. Pour la postérité, au contraire, il a le plus grand mérite, celui de la ressemblance. Au dire de Madame Campin, Il n'existe de bon portrait de la reine que cette toile de Wertmüller et celle que Madame Lebrun peignit en 1787. Page 282. In January 1904, Miss Lamont went to the Comédie Française to see the Barbier de Séville and noticed that the alguazils standing round were dressed exactly like our garden officials but had red stockings added. This was interesting as the Comédie Française is the descendant of the Royal Private Theatre and the old royal liveries worn by the subordinate actors, who were, in earlier times, the royal servants, are carefully reproduced at it. Also, she reported that Almaviva was dressed in a dark cloak and a large Spanish hat, which was said to be the outdoor dress of French gentlemen of the period. E. M. On Monday, July 4th, 1904, Miss Lamont and I went to the Trianon, this being my second visit. We were accompanied by Mademoiselle Blanc, who had not heard our story. On the Saturday of the same week, July 9th, we went again unaccompanied. Both days were brilliant and hot. On both occasions, the dust, 
glare, trams, and comers and goers were entirely different from the quietness and solitude of our visit in 1901. We went up the lane, as at the first time, and turned to the right on reaching the building, which we had now learned to call the Logement des Corps de Garde. From this point, everything was changed. The old wall facing us had gates, but they were closed, and the one through which we had seen the drive passing through a grove of trees seemed to have been closed for a very long time. We came directly to the gardener's house, which was quite different in appearance from the cottage described by Miss Lamont in 1901, in front of which she saw the woman and the girl. Beyond the gardener's house was a parterre with flower beds and a smooth lawn of many years' careful tendance. It did not seem to be the place where we had met the garden officials. We spent a long time looking for the old paths. Not only was there no trace of them, but the distances were contracted, and all was on a smaller scale than I recollected. The kiosk was gone. So was the ravine and the little cascade which had fallen from a height above our heads, and the little bridge over the ravine was, of course, gone too. The large bridge with the rocher over it crossing one side of the lake at the foot of the Belvedere, had no resemblance to it. The trees were quite natural and seemed to have been a good deal cleared out, making that part of the garden much less wooded and picturesque. The English garden in front of the house was not shaded by many trees, and we could see the house and the amo from almost every point. Instead of a much shaded rough meadow continuing up to the wall of the terrace, there is now a broad gravel sweep beneath it, and the trees on the grass are gone. Exactly where the lady was sitting, we found a large spreading bush of apparently many years' growth. We did not recognize the present staircase, which leads up to the northwest end of the terrace, nor the extension of wall round which one has now to go in order to reach the staircase. We thought that we went up to the terrace from some point nearer to the house from the English garden, the present exit from the French garden to the avenue was not so near the house as we expected, nor was it so broad as we remembered it. To add to the impossibility of recalling our first visit, in every corner we came across groups of noisy, merry people walking or sitting in the shade, garden seats placed everywhere, and stalls for fruit and lemonade took away from any idea of desolation. The commonplace, unhistorical atmosphere was totally inconsistent with the air of silent mystery by which we had been so much oppressed. Though for several years Miss Lamont had assured me of the change, I had not expected such complete disillusionment. One thing struck me greatly. People went wherever they liked, and no one would think of interfering to show the way or to prevent anyone from going in any direction. We searched the place at our pleasure. We went to the Amo, following the path taken by Miss Lamont on January 2, 1902. We tried to find the thick wood in which she had lost her way, but there was nothing like it, and such paths as there are now are perfectly visible from one another, even in summer. We asked a gardener sweeping one of the paths whether that part of the grounds had ever been a thick wood. He said he believed that it had been, but could give us no date beyond the fact that it was before his time, more than twenty years ago. On our return to Versailles, we went into a bookseller's shop and asked if he had any maps or views of the Petit Trianon as it had been in old days. He showed us a picture, which he would not part with, of the Jeux de Bague. We saw at once that the central building had some likeness to the kiosk, but the surrounding part was not like and its position was unsuitable for our purpose. We inquired about the green uniforms of the garden officials, and he emphatically denied their existence. He said that green was one of the colors of the royal liveries, and when we answered that three years before persons in long green coats had directed us in the grounds, he spoke of it as impossible unless, he added, they were masqueraders. One of the gardiens of the palace also told us that green was a royal livery and that now only the president had the right to use it on certain occasions. We asked how long the gardens had been thrown open to the public and people allowed to wander everywhere and were told that it had been so for years, and this evidently implied a great many years. 
The result of this visit was to make us take a graver view of the two first visits, and we resolved to look into the matter as carefully as we could and to be entirely silent about the change of scenery until we had explained it somewhat to ourselves. After some years, and in spite of various false leads, we have been able to put together some very interesting facts. The details of the search are recorded in a book which, to us, goes by the name of the Green Book. It contains the original papers written in 1901, the history of the gradual accumulation of information, correspondence with one another, and also with others on the subject, the accounts written by one or two friends who have helped us at different times, also pictures, maps, and lists of books consulted, and the account of curious incidents which took place during the search. E. M. F. L. End of Section 1. Read by Martha Weller, Champaign, Illinois, May 11, 2023. Section 2 of An Adventure by Charlotte Ann Elizabeth Moberly and Eleanor Jourdain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2. Summary of Results of Research. The Plow. The first incident in our expedition to Trianon in 1901 was that, after passing the Logement des Corps de Garde, a small hand plow was seen by Miss Lamont lying on the ground, not far from some wide-open gates, in an old wall opposite to us, through which we could see the stems of a grove of trees and a drive leading through it. In 1905, Miss Lamont was told by a gardener that no plow was kept at Trianon. There was no need of one, as the government only required the lawns, walks, water, trees, and flowers to be kept up. In 1908, another gardener told us both that plows have entirely altered in character since the Revolution, and it was not likely that the old type would be seen anywhere in France now. It would seem that no plow was used ordinarily at Trianon even in old days, for amongst a list of tools bought for the gardeners from 1780 to 1789, there is no mention of a plow. We learned in 1905 from Desjardins' book that throughout the reign of Louis XVI, an old plow used in his predecessor's reign had been preserved at the Petit Trianon, and sold with the king's other properties during the Revolution. A picture of this identical plow, procured in 1907, showed that it had handles like the one seen in 1901, but the cutting part was hidden in the ground and could not be compared. In the old map of 1783, there is plowed land, where later the amo was built and the sheet of water placed, but there is none in the later maps, nor any now to be seen in the grounds. The Guards the second event was our meeting with two dignified, thoughtful-looking officials, dressed in long green coats and three-cornered hats, holding something in their hands which Miss Lamont wrote of in 1901 as possibly being staves. In response to our inquiry for the Petit Trianon, they coldly directed us forward. There are no officials so dressed at Trianon now. At present, they wear black, with tricolor rosettes in their hats. In summer, they have white trousers. In 1904, we were told by fully informed persons at Versailles that it was impossible that we should have seen such uniforms, unless they were worn by masqueraders, for green was a royal livery and no one wore it now at Trianon. Supposing them to have been masqueraders, the dress may have been that of Garde de la Porte, the ceremonial overdress of the Garde de la Porte, as was that of part of the Garde du Corps, Garde de la Manche, was green with gold and silver embroidery and red stockings. They carried halberds, but the officers had galons instead of embroidery and no red stockings. They carried an ebony cane with an ivory ball. The livery of the Comte d'Artois, who was colonel général of the Garde Suisse, was green, and those of the Garde du Corps and Suisse, who were in his service, had green uniforms. There is evidence of a much quieter dress without even galons called the Petite Livret, which was probably green, as it was worn by the Suisse, Piqueur, Garde de la Porte, and the Garçon Jardinier. The traditional dress of those royal servants who filled the minor parts in the Royal Theatre at Versailles is still to be seen at the acting of the Barbier de Séville in the Comédie Française, which is the descendant of the Royal Theatre. This dress, 
except for the added red stockings, is the same as the one we saw in 1901. In 1908, we learned that the Porte du Jardinier at the Petit Trianon was always guarded dans le temps, and that on October 5th, 1789, the guards were two of the three Berzy brothers, who, with Breval, were generally on duty whenever the queen was in residence at Trianon. From their writing and spelling, they were evidently well-educated. In 1910, we found that they had the title of Garçon Jardinier de la Chambre, and they are said to have been stationed in La Pépinière Proche La Maison. The most ancient pépinière was close to the gardener's house. Cottage, woman, and girl. Whilst speaking to the two men, Miss Lamont observed on her right hand a solidly built cottage with stone steps, on which a woman in old-fashioned dress was standing, handing something to a girl of about thirteen or fourteen, who wore a white cap and skirts nearly reaching to her ankles. In 1904, Miss Lamont saw a picture resembling this cottage in its general appearance in the Albin de Trianon at the Bibliothèque Nationale. In 1908, she and a friend discovered such a cottage, more than one, within the gates which were not far from the place where she had seen the plow. These cottages were not in the right position for our experience in 1901, but the type was the same. In 1908, we discovered from the map of 1783 that there was a building, not now in existence, placed against the wall, outside, of the gardener's yard between the Ruelle and the Porte du Jardinier. If our original route lay through this yard to the English garden, this building would be exactly in the right place for Miss Lamont's cottage. In September 1910, we saw from marks on this wall that a building might have stood here, for the cornice of the wall is broken into, and there seems to be a perpendicular line from it to the ground visible through the plaster. A photograph shows this. If the girl seen should be the Marion of Madame Julie Lavergne's story, first read in 1906, she would have been 14 years old in 1789, and her mother was then alive. Her father's house would have been near the reservoir and not within the locked gates of any enclosure, for she let herself out at night by an open window. All this would suit the position of the building in the map. The Kiosk On our entrance into the English garden in 1901, we found our path crossed by another, beyond which, in front of us but rather to the left hand, stood a small circular building having pillars and a low surrounding wall. It was on rough, uneven ground and was overshadowed by trees. Repeated searches during seven years by ourselves and others have failed to discover this building. In September 1908, Miss Lamont found in the archives a paper, without signature or date, giving the estimate for a ruin having seven ionic columns, walls, and a dome roof. A ruin seems only to mean a copy of an older building. If the walls of this building were low, it would correspond in appearance with our recollection of the kiosk. This ruin is said to have formed a naissance de la rivière, suggesting its position above the small lake which fed the principal river. A piece of old water pipe is still to be seen on the northwestern side of the small lake. If this ruin and two others of those alluded to in the archives were one and the same, there is additional reason for placing the columned building in this part of the garden. 1. In 1788, it is stated that rocks were placed at intervals on a path leading from La Ruine to the deuxième source du Ravin, beyond the wooden bridge. Desjardins considers one of the sources to have been close to the theater which was at our right hand. This might have been the second spring. 2. Meek states that in 1780 he placed a small architectural ruine above the grotto. A note in the archives, dated 1777, speaks of the porte d'entrée au bout du grotte. If, as we believe, we had just passed out of the gardener's yard by this porte d'entrée, we should have been close to the earliest place grotto. In 1909, two old maps were procured from Paris. In one, dated perhaps 1840, there is something which may indicate a small round building placed on the rocher behind the Belvedere. The other map was reproduced from an old one of 1705, but added to until a railway appears in it. In this map, below the name Pavillon de Musique, the Belvedere, is the name Le Kiosque. 
It does not seem likely that a second name for the Belvedere should be given, and it may therefore refer to something else which does not appear in this map. Therefore, the mere chance name which from the first moment we gave to our building was justified by there having been something called by that name exactly in that part of the garden. In 1910, we looked out this name in the best etymological French dictionary and found that it was admitted to the French Academy in 1762 as Pavillon ouvert de tous côtés and defined by Thévenot, contemporary, as Kioch ou divan qui est maintenant de huit grosses colonnes, the man by the kiosk. On our first visit, a dark-complexioned man, marked by smallpox, was sitting close to the kiosk. He wore a large dark cloak and a slouch hat. Though we were assured in 1908 by a very good authority that no gentleman now living at Versailles would wear a large cloak either in winter or summer, there might be nothing surprising in what we saw if the kiosk could be found. But considering that it is gone, it is historically interesting that we discovered in 1904 that there is one man in the story of Trianon who exactly suits the description. Most of the intimate accounts of the period say that the Comte de Vaudreuil was a Creole and marked by smallpox. He was at one time one of the Queen's innermost circle of friends, but acted an enemy's part in persuading her to gain the King's permission for the acting of the politically dangerous play of Le Mariage de Figaro. The King had long refused to allow it, saying that it would cause the Bastille to be taken. The earlier version of the same play, Le Barbier de Seville, was last acted at Trianon, August 19, 1785, just at the beginning of the diamond necklace episode when Vaudreuil took the part of Almaviva and was dressed for it in a large dark cloak and Spanish hat. In 1908, we found out from Madame Eloff's journal, The Queen's Modiste, that in 1789 the broad-brimmed hat had entirely displaced the three-cornered hat and was generally fashionable also that swords were no longer generally worn. Vaudreuil left the court of France amongst the first party of émigrés after the taking of the Bastille, July 1789. The Running Man Though we were surprised when the second man, also dressed in a large cloak and hat, ran up to us and with extreme earnestness directed us to go to the right rather than to the left, yet we merely thought his manner very French and as he said in the course of a rather long, unintelligible sentence, Cherchez la maison, we imagined that he understood that we were looking for the house and followed his direction. We noticed that he stood in front of a rock and seemed to come either over, round, or through it. The following year, 1902, we learned that there was a tradition that on October 5, 1789, a messenger was sent to Trianon to warn the queen of the approach of the mob from Paris that she wished to walk back to the palace by the most direct route, but the messenger begged her to wait at the house whilst he fetched the carriage, as it was safer to drive back as usual by the broad roads of the park. A local tradition affirming this has been embodied by Madame Julie Lavergne in a volume entitled, unfortunately for historical purposes, Légende de Trianon. This particular scene in the story called La Dernière Rose interested us greatly for it seemed to come from an eyewitness and recalled many of the points of our vision. The queen, it is said, had been walking with and talking to Marion, the daughter of an undergardener, before going to her favorite grotto. After remaining there some time, and on growing alarmed at her own sad thoughts, the queen called to Marion and was surprised to see, instead of the girl, a garçon de la chambre suddenly appear, trembling in all his limbs, after reading the letter brought to her from the minister at the palace, the queen desired him to order the carriage and to let Madame de Tourzel know. The messenger bowed, as our man had done, and once, out of sight, ran off at full speed. The queen followed him to the house. Inquiries through the publisher in 1907 as to Madame Lavergne's sources of information elicited the fact that her informant as to every detail of that scene had been Marion herself. This Marion, the Légende tell us, afterwards married Monsieur Charpentier, an undergardener, known in 1789 by the name of Jean de Lot, on account of his bringing water daily from Ville d'Avray for the Queen's table. He afterwards became jardinier en chef, being appointed in 1805 by Napoleon in succession to Antoine Richard. 
The name Charpentier appears in 1786 amongst the ouvriers terrassiers, who clear up sticks and leaves, plant flowers, and rake. In 1783, Mariamne received wages for picking up leaves in the Trianon grounds. This is quite possible, as children are said to have been used for that work, and the absence of surnames suggests that she was the daughter of one of the gardeners. The marriage certificate of Alexandre Charpentier in 1823 gives his father's name as Louis Toussaint Charpentier and his mother's name as Marie-Anne Le Maignon. The marriage certificate of these persons, from which we should have learnt their age, is said to have been destroyed. In the wages book, the names of two Le Mongain, elder and younger, appear, also Magny, but not, so far as has been discovered, Le Magnon. If this Marie-Anne Charpentier was 21 years old at her son's birth, November 1796, she would have been eight years old in 1783 and 14 in 1789. This would suit the Mariamne of the archives, Madame Lavergne's story, and the girl seen by Miss Lamont. Two more points show the faithfulness of Marion's account of that scene. Madame Lavergne, quoting her, says that pale rays of autumn sunshine lighted up the faded flowers. It must, therefore, have been fairly fine, and in the wages book, it appears that on October 5th, 1789, all the gardeners were at work in the grounds, and it is stated that on wet days they worked under cover, sometimes clearing out the passages of the house. Secondly, she says that the queen sat at the entrance of her grotto, where fallen leaves choked the course of the ruisseau. From entries of payment, it appears that the streams were cleared of dead leaves on October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1789, but not on the 4th or 5th, or ever again. It is exactly a point which Marion would have noticed. Madame Lavergne lived at Versailles from 1838 till her marriage in 1844, at which time Marion would have been 69, and as we believe that Alexandre Charpentier was head gardener at the Petit Trianon for over 50 years, his mother would have been easily accessible to Madame Lavergne during her repeated visits to Trianon, even after her marriage. Her father, Monsieur Georges Ozano, was a personal friend of Louis Philippe and was constantly about in the royal palaces. It is necessary to speak of the grotto, for Madame Campin says that the queen était assise dans sa grotte lorsqu'elle reçut un mot d'écrit qui la suppliait de rentrer à Versailles. Madame Lavergne says, Marion se dirigea vers la parterre des rosiers et la reine alla s'asseoir à l'entrée de sa grotte favorite auprès de la petite source. Les feuilles jaunies tombaient des arbres, couvraient la terre et obstruaient le cours du ruisseau. Le murmure de la petite cascade qui arrose l'intérieur de la grotte retentissait seule dans le bosquet. Effrayée d'être seule, elle appela Marianne. Mais au lieu de la jeune fille, un garçon de la chambre parut, une lettre à la main. The queen cannot, therefore, have been many steps away from the grotto, at one end or the other, when the messenger came to her. In 1908, we asked to be shown this grotto, and we were taken to one on the further side of the Belvedere, near the hill called L'Escargot, which was formed in 1781. We felt sure that this could not have been either of the two grottos spoken of in the archives. In 1777, the end of one grotto is mentioned as being near the Porte d'Entrée, à la cloison de la Porte d'Entrée du Jardin, au bout du grotte, trois potereaux et deux traverses. In 1777, there was a projet d'un pont et chute en rocher avec parapet. This was probably a bridge, the Vergelay Bridge, over the principal river where it issued from the larger lake. The river was made at this time. In June 1780, a new petite rivière was planned to receive the water drained from the Ravin de la Grotte and to conduct it into the larger lake. For this purpose, a new grotto was made of a forme ovale Orné en glaçon, through which the Petite Riviere was to run. A ravin du Petit Pont was also planned. In August 1780, masses of rock were procured, and the Petite Riviere was begun, and also a hill was thrown up pour couvrir la grotte. In September 1780, Bourdin a passé la journée, a posé le deuxième pont venant du côté de la grotte. The second bridge was probably the present Rocher Bridge, being the second placed over the lakes. Neither of these two bridges would be the Pont de Bois, 
and La Conduite en Bois, two descriptions of, and identical with, the one alluded to in the words Ravin du Petit Pont, which was said to have been erected on high ground au-dessus du Rocher du Ravin. In December 1780, the work was finished. Conduite de l'exécution de la grotte, petite rivière, et chute d'eau retombante dans le Grand Lac, autre petit ravin dans la montagne près du Grand Lac à la fin de la petite rivière de la grotte. In 1781, a montagne was made en face du Jardin Français, en face de la Comédie. In March and April 1781, a hill called L'Escargot was piled up beyond the Belvedere, and presumably a third and very small grotto was made. The creation of the Escargot Hill would have made the Ravin on the north side of the Belvedere, which is still visible, and leads to the greater lake. There are several reasons why we think that the Queen's Grotto, the second maid, was on the theater side of the Belvedere. 1. Desecs' description of it in 1789 shows that, though a ruisseau passed through it, persons could go freely out at both ends, whereas when water was passing down through the upper entrance of the Escargot Grotto, no one could have used it at the same time. There is only room for the water. 2. He speaks of the prairie being visible from une crevasse qui s'ouvrait à la tête du lit. This would have been possible from a grotto on the theater side, but not on the other, as the Escargot Hill would have been in the way. 3. Desec describes a staircase which conduisait au sommet de la roche, enabling persons to leave hurriedly. There is something like an ancient rock staircase attached to the back of the large rock, giving the name to the Rocher Bridge. 4. He says that the grotto was very dark on first entering, and Lespinasse's picture of the Belvedere in 1783 shows the opening to a cavern on its southern side close to the Rocher Bridge, which could be truly described as venant du côté de la grotte. Could the rock out of which the cavernous mouth was cut have been lifted over the long bridge at some later time? For in Lespinasse's picture, there is no such rock over the bridge as there is now, and the cavern has disappeared. 5. The map of 1783 represents, according to Desjardins, le projet de Mic complètement exécuté. In it, the figure, 5, indicating the grotto, occurs both at the Escargot and also on the theater side of the Belvedere. In September 1910, Miss Lamont was asked whether she had seen a map of the place recently placed in the front hall of the Petit Trianon, and she said no. On going there, she found the map, which had not been there at any of her former visits, and saw that the grottos were put, as far as she could judge, just where we had long ago, through elaborate personal research, decided must be their real position. She could only make this out by standing on the table amongst the books and photographs the map being hung too high to be easily seen. Several further points of interest have emerged in connection with the running man. One, in April 1908, we learned that our being directed at all in the grounds was unusual, for since September 1870, they have been thrown open until dark. The difficulty now experienced is to find a guide. Two, he spoke of the maison. In 1907, we found out that the queen was in the habit of calling the Petit Trianon Ma Maison de Trianon, to distinguish it from the palace and the chateau. Louis XVI had presented it to Marie Antoinette on his accession. 3. The Queen is reported by Marion to have addressed the messenger as Breton. This was not an uncommon name about the court and old Versailles. The court almanac for 1783 shows that then the Queen had a page de l'écurie called de Bretagne, the page de la chambre sometimes became de l'écurie before receiving a commission or some other office. He is not mentioned in the Almanac of 1789, but, as we know from other instances, it does not follow necessarily that he had no office in the household. Madame Eloff, the queen's modiste, mentions a Mademoiselle Breton amongst the queen's women, who does not appear in the Almanac. If de Bretagne was 16 years old in 1783, he would have been 22 in 1789, just in the fresh young vigor suitable to our running man. The name Breton may have referred to his nationality only, for in November 1907, we discovered that the accent in which the man spoke to us resembled the Breton accent. 
in which the consonants are strengthened and the diphthongs broadened. In the autumn of 1909, we read the Baron de Fernilly's Souvenirs, in which it is stated that wigs were universally worn by gentlemen in French society up till 1787. After that date, powdered hair became the general usage. The first person, Monsieur de Valence, who ventured to appear with unpowdered hair, did so, apparently, in 1788, after which it became a mark of extreme fashion. The same was the case with buckled shoes. Gold, silver, stones, and rosettes had been required for a gentleman's dress ornaments, but after the commercial treaty with England in 1786, steel was used for everything. Buckled shoes are expressly mentioned as being very fashionable in 1789, and there was, at that time, a rage for steel ornaments. Bridge over Little Cascade. Following the man's direction, we turned to the right and walked over a small rustic bridge which crossed a tiny waterfall coming from above us on our right hand and flowing in front of a little rocky cliff with ferns growing in the crevices. The water seemed to have formed a steep, narrow little ravine, which shelved away below us to a little glimmering pool. Neither bridge nor cascade nor ravine can be found, or anything suggesting them. In 1905, the person in charge at the house assured Miss Lamont that there never had been more than one cascade, meaning the rush of water under the Rocher Bridge. The Rocher Bridge is certainly not the one we crossed, which was high above the level of the lakes. In 1907, we bought Souvenir d'Ampage by the Comte des Zec. He says, En face du château, une pelouse se terminée par une roche ombragée de pain, de tuya, de mélèze, et surmontée d'un pont rustique, comme on en rencontre dans les montagnes de la Suisse et les précipices du Valais. Cette perspective agreste et sauvage rendait plus douce celle de la troisième façade du château. He also speaks of water passing through the moss-lined grotto, which, according to our idea, must have been below us, but close by on our right hand. Madame Lavergne writes of the petite cascade and of the sound of it in the grotto. In April 1908, extracts from Meek's accounts and plans for the Trianon grounds were procured from the archives, giving the history of the grottoes. Juin 4, 1780, fait un modèle en terre du ravin du Petit Pont. 1788, pièce au-dessus du rocher du ravin et passage des voitures sur le pont de bois. Pièce à droite en face du rocher du ravin. Au long du chemin de l'emplacement de la ruine, sur la conduite en bois à la deuxième source du ravin. The first source was probably close to the ruin, our kiosk. The second source might coincide with Desjardins' source, which he places a few steps from the Poulailler, and was probably meant to feed the Petite Riviere, which passed through the Queen's Grotto, carrying off the water from the stagnant pool between the grottoes to the larger lake. That would exactly agree with the position of our little cascade, small bridge, and glimmering pool. In April 1908, an old manuscript map was found among such archive papers as relate to the grottoes, showing a small bridge in the right position relatively to the lakes, the Rocher Bridge, and the place where we believe the Queen's Grotto to have been. Isolated Rock In 1908, we found a mass of rock standing in the dry bed of the small lake. On one rock covered with ivy were two full-grown pine trees. It seems unlikely that the trees should have originally been in the small circular basin of water. Desec says that tuya and pine trees were planted high up over the grotto to give it the appearance of a Swiss mountain. The grotto was destroyed about 1792, and it is possible that some of the rocks covering it were displaced and allowed to slip into the lake below, and that the present pine trees may have been seedlings at the time for we are told that the life of a pine tree is from 100 to 200 years old. In 1908, we noticed that at one side of this ivy-covered rock were peculiar projections. One of these was broken off short, but the other was intact. We thought they might once have formed supports for a small bridge. Rocks are said to have been placed in 1788 at the Montagne des Pins à gauche et en montant au rocher. Montagne des Pins à droite en montant au rocher. In January 1791, trees were torn up from the montagna. In February, March, April 1792, 
Every few days occurs the entry, Journée à arracher les tuyas sur les montagnes. According to the old picture by Lespinasse, 1783, there was nothing over the low, long bridge between the two lakes, but there was, by the side of it, just where the grotto would have ended, a cavern in a rock. This is no longer there, but possibly the face of rock with the cavern-like opening may have been lifted over the bridge, and account for the very peculiar rock which is at present above the bridge, causing it to be called the Rocher Bridge. A rough rock staircase, which has no meaning, is attached to this rock behind. Desec speaks of a staircase as having been within the grotto, leading up to its entrance on the high ground on the montagne. Has it been moved to the lower end of the grotto? There is now no isolated rock standing up as we saw it behind the running man, only mounds covered with shrubs and trees. But in the archives there is a note saying that in 1788 rocks were placed in various parts, and one is especially mentioned. Pièce donnant au bord du lac de l'ancien côté des rochers, au long du chemin de l'emplacement de la ruine, sur la conduite en bois à la deuxième source du ravin. This would have been the path we were on in 1901. Pelouse. It is easy to suppose that between the years 1901 to 1904, trees were cleared away from the rough ground on the north side of the house, which in 1901 had given it the look of an orchard. So much was this the case that the lady sitting under the north terrace was thought to be making a study of tree stems, for she was looking into trees and she held a large paper in her hand and as we passed held it out at arm's length. At present there are trees on each side of the pelouse, and one growing near the site of the old jeu de bague, but none growing in front of the house, and it all looks drier, brighter, and less confined than in 1901. We have found two interesting mentions of this pelouse. Before the new theater was built in 1779, the old comédie stood on it for three years. When the comédie was moved, it gave place to a pelouse parsemée d'arbres. The Lady Nothing unusual marked the lady sitting on a low seat on the grass immediately under the north terrace. I remember recognizing that her light-colored skirt, white fish shoe, and straw hat were in the present fashion, but they struck me as rather dowdy in the general effect. She was so near us that I looked full at her, and she bent slightly forward to do the same. I never doubted that we had both seen her, and three months after was astonished to hear that Miss Lamont had not done so. That sounds simple to others. To ourselves, it is inexplicable. Miss Lamont had seen the plow, the cottage, the woman, and the girl, which I had not, but she is generally more observant than I, and there were other things to look at. At this moment, there was nothing to see on the right, and merely a shady, damp-looking meadow on the left, and the lady was sitting in front of the house we had come to see, and were both eagerly studying. The lady was visible some way off. We walked side by side straight up to her, leaving her slightly on the left hand as we passed up the steps to the terrace, from whence I saw her again from behind, and noticed that her fichu had become a pale green. The fact that she had not been seen at a moment when we were both a little exercised by our meeting with the men, one looking so unpleasant and the other so unaccountably and infectiously excited, made a deep impression. The legend that we heard the following winter of the Queen, having been occasionally seen sitting in front of the house in the English garden, is of course incapable of proof, but three things were to us full of interest. 1. In 1902, I saw Wertmüller's picture of the Queen, which alone of all the many portraits shown me in any way brought back the face I had seen, for the face was more square and the nose shorter. A few weeks later, we read that Madame Campin considered it almost the only picture of her that was really like, though other people thought that it did not do her justice. 2. In April 1908, we learned that there was only one time during the Queen's tenure of the Petit Trianon when she could have seen strangers in her gardens, from which, in earlier days, the court was entirely excluded and to which even the King only came by invitation. For four months after May 1789, when the court was carried off to Paris, the public streamed in as it liked. So many came to see the place that had been too much talked about that the king and queen had gone that summer to Marly for a little rest and quiet. That was the time when Desec, with one of the deputies, walked round and saw the grotto and the little bridge. At the time, the Trianon officials must have learnt to treat strangers with cold politeness, but probably resenting the necessity. 
This exactly accounts for the manner of the guards at the Porte du Jardinier. They made no difficulty and told us that we should find the house by going that way, but in quite an unusual manner for Frenchmen. It was mechanical and disengaged. 3. In the summer of 1908, we read the journal of Madame Eloff, the Queen's modiste. She says that during the year 1789, the Queen was extremely economical and had very few dresses made. Madame Eloff repaired several light, washing, short skirts, and made in July and September two green silk bodices, besides many large white fichu. This agrees exactly with the dress seen in 1901. The skirt was not of a fresh white, but was light colored, slightly yellowish. The white fichu in front seemed to have an edge of green or gold, just as it would have appeared if the white muslin or gauze was over green. The color would have shown more clearly at the back, but in front, where the white folds accumulated, the green would have been less prominent. The straight edge in front and the frill behind had often puzzled me, but in Madame Eloff's illustrations of the fashions at that time, there are instances of the same thing. There is in the book a colored picture of the green silk bodice, with all the measurements to enable her to fit the queen perfectly. Jeu de bague. As we approached the terrace at the northwest corner of the house, we had some barrier on our right hand entirely blocking the view, so that we could see nothing but the meadow on our left hand and the house with its terrace in front. At present, the pathway which curves towards the house, and is very likely the old one, has a large bare space on the right hand, with one beautiful old tree growing on the edge of it. And from some way off, one can easily see across it to the chapel beyond the French garden. A long piece of wall extends westward from the terrace, round which one has to go into the French garden in order to find the staircase, whilst the whole length of wall, including part of the north terrace, is hidden by a large old spreading bush, completely covering the place where the lady sat. Originally, we could not see the steps whilst on the path, but after we had passed the barrier on our right hand, we found them at once without going round any wall. The map of 1783 shows us that the Jeu de Bague, put up in 1776, once stood on what is now bare space. It was a circular building surrounded by a wooden gallery masked by trees. This would have completely shut out the view, and the path was probably curved on its account. In 1907, we learned that the Queen had a passage made under the terrace from the house to the Jeu de Bague, and in 1908, we discovered the old walled-up doorway leading into the English garden behind the bush. The ground seems to have been a good deal raised since it was used. Four feet to the right of this door, just at the point where the top of the present staircase is reached, is a change of masonry, the rest of the wall being plastered over. In 1910, we found that this extension of the wall was composed of rubble. Perhaps it had been added to the stone terrace in the time of Louis-Philippe. If the present staircase is old, we could have reached it easily from the English garden in the absence of the wall, but if it is not old and it is not indicated in Meek's map, there may have been something quite different, even steps turned northwards towards the English garden. In 1910, we also learned that the bush had been planted when the Duchesse d'Orléans occupied the house. The Chapel Man Whilst we were standing at the southwest end of the terrace above the French garden, the door of a building at right angles to the house suddenly opened, and a young man came out and slammed the door behind him. He came to us very quickly along a level. His manner was jaunty and imperious, and he told us that the only way to the house was by the Cour d'Honneur. It was difficult to hear what he said. We thought at once that we were trespassing and looked for some way down from the terrace, upon which he constituted himself our guide, and, with an inquisitive, amused expression, went with us a little way down the French garden and showed us out into the avenue by a broad road. There is much to say about this incident. 1. The man evidently did not mean us to stand on the terrace so near to the house and forced us to move away. He was the second person that afternoon who had excitedly insisted on our going one way rather than another. But now we know that since 1870 the gardens and terraces have been made public until dark and people walk about freely. No one has ever stopped us since, nor can we hear of anyone else who has been guided as we were. 2. In 1905, we found that the building out of which the man came was the old chapel, which is in a ruinous condition. In 1906, Miss Lamont had leave to go into the chapel, which she had to enter from the avenue, there being no entrance from the garden. 
When inside, she saw that the door out of which he had come was one leading into the royal gallery. The gallery now stands isolated, high up on the north wall of the chapel. Formerly, from inside, it was reached by a door on a landing at the top of a staircase. The staircase is completely broken down, and the floor of the landing is gone, so that there is now no access to the gallery. The terrace door of the gallery is bolted, barred, and cobwebbed over from age and disuse. The guide said that the door had not been opened in the memory of any man there, not since it was used by the court. In April 1907, Miss Lamont went again to the chapel, this time with two companions. Their guide then told them that the doors had not been opened to his knowledge for fifteen years, and the great door not since it was used by the court of Louis XVI. Moi, je suis ici depuis quinze ans, et je sais que les portes ont été condamnées bien avant cela. He added that having the sole charge of the keys, no one could have opened the doors without his knowledge, and smiled at the idea as he looked at the blocked-up old doors. In August 1907, two other friends went to the chapel and entirely confirmed all that had been said about its ruined condition and the impossibility of the great door having been opened in 1901. Their guide told them that the big door had been Marie Antoinette's private entrance, the gallery was still standing and had two chairs on it of gilt and old red velvet, but when they asked whether it was possible to enter it, the guide laughed and pointed to the staircase. There was no other entrance, he said, and the stairs had been in that condition for the last ten years. They thought, from the look of the stairs, that they had probably been so for much longer. In September 1910, a fifth friend went to the chapel and bore witness to the impossibility of the doors having been used in 1901 and was told that the staircase had finally broken down 15 years before. 3. From Desjardins' book, we learned that the Queen's concierge had been Bonnefoy Duplan. He had rooms between the chapel and the Cour d'Honneur and kept his stores in a loft over the chapel, reached by the now broken-down old staircase. The window of this attic still looks over the French garden, and from it, in old days, he would have seen anyone approaching the house from that side. The name of the Suisse, the porter, in charge of the Porte du Perron de la Chapelle in 1789, was Lagrange. His rooms were immediately behind the chapel, looking into the avenue. He could easily have been sent through the chapel to interview strangers on the terrace. 4. We did not lose sight of the man when he came to us. As it is now, he must have gone quite out of sight, down one flight of steps outside the chapel door, and, after passing under a high wall, have reached the terrace, where we were standing, by a second set of steps. The present wall of the chapel courtyard is so high as to hide half the door, and a large chestnut tree in the courtyard hides it from the part of the terrace on which we were, even in winter. In April 1907, we discovered that a continuous ground floor passage from the kitchens once passed the chapel door to the house. This set us wondering as to whether there had ever been a pathway above it. The same year we were told that the chapel courtyard round which the passage had gone had been enlarged. In August 1907, two friends reported to us and photographed a mark on the outside of the courtyard wall showing where it might at some time have been raised. In March 1908, Another mark on the chapel was discovered, revealing that there had once been an inner wall to the courtyard, which might have been removed when the courtyard was enlarged. We also found out that the levels were so different that the passage would have been partly underground on the side of the French garden, but in the rez-de-chaussée in the courtyard and where it flanked the Cour d'Honneur. We noticed from the photographs that the bastion at the southwest corner of the house in the Cour d'Honneur looked older than the top part of the wall adjoining it above the chapel courtyard. In September 1910, permission was given to enter this courtyard. When within, it was definitely explained that above the kitchen passage there had been a covered way by which the queen would enter the chapel from the house in wet weather. The top of this covered way had been de plein pied, joining the bit of terrace outside the chapel door to the terrace by the house. This would have been the level way along which our man came to us. The marks of the passage and covered way, forming the intervening piece of terrace, were perfectly clear both on the inside of the present wall and on the ground in the courtyard. The present balustrade adjoining the bastion was probably placed when the old covered way was destroyed and the outside wall was raised. 
It was also noticed that the round windows in the bastion lighted the lower kitchen passage, but that those facing the French garden, being on a higher level, lighted the covered way. The guide stated that the tree in the center of the chapel courtyard had certainly been planted after the days of the monarchy. 5. The road from the garden to the avenue, through which the man ushered us, was not far from the chapel and was broad enough to admit a coach. The present one is narrower and further to the west. In 1907, we read a note by Monsieur de Nolac in Les Consignes de Marie Antoinette, in which he says that the old Porte de la Ménagerie, which must have led from the avenue to the French garden, is now lost, but that it must have been tout auprès des bâtiments de la Conciergerie et des Cuisines. We thought that perhaps it was the one we went by, and on looking at Meek's map of 1783, found a broad road dividing the kitchen court into two parts. At present, solid continuous buildings on the two sides of the kitchen court show no sign of an entrance, though in two places the roofs have a difference of level. In April 1909, a Frenchman, who sold prints and seemed to be a specialist in maps, said that Meek's map was the only authoritative one. In September 1910, we learned from the first authority that Meek's map was exact, that the road found in it had certainly existed, and its position relatively to the pond in the French garden was explained. A search for some sign of it was at once made, and successfully. On the garden side, not at all far from the chapel, the jamb of an old opening still projects from the building, covered with ivy, and the stones on the ground are laid for a space of about 12 paces, the other way from the stones on either side, evidently to make a carriage road. A large rectangular stone was lying on the ground, which might either have been a step or part of the second jam. On the avenue side, marks of an opening of some sort can be traced through the plaster with which Louis-Philippe finished the buildings after restoring and also altering them. The opening would have included two present windows not far from the Porte de la Bouche, as the signs of it are visible on both sides of the opening, and the space between is from 12 to 20 paces. Within the kitchen court, the buildings have been so altered and plastered over that no traces of change could be found. All the points corresponded with the recollection of the roadway through which we had passed in 1901. Two Laborers with Cart On her second visit, January 2, 1902, Miss Lamont saw, in the field near the Amo, two laborers in brown tunics and bright-colored short capes loading a cart with sticks. The capes hardly came below their shoulders and had hoods. One was bright blue and the other red. In May 1904, a search was made in the archives with the result that it was clear that carts and horses for the purpose of tidying the grounds were hired by the day in old times and not kept in the farm for constant use. In January 1789, two men, instead of the usual one, plus un homme, were hired pour ramasser les loques de chenille et les brûler. In 1906, we discovered that the tunic and short cape were worn by the bourgeoisie in the 14th century. In April 1908, we had proof that the artisans were wearing them in the 18th century and that some of the working men at Trianon in 1776 had art de couleur. The entry in the wages book showed that up to 1783, from time to time, une voiture à un cheval et un conducteur were hired for picking up branches and sticks in the parks. But on October 4, 1789, a cart with two horses, almost certainly requiring two men, was hired for three days for the purpose. In August 1908, a former gardener, who had been at Trianon long enough to remember both the charpentier, father and son, laughed at the idea of such a dress being worn now at Trianon, as it belonged to the Ancien Régime. He assured us that carts of the present day in France had scarcely altered at all in type, and that the two now in use at Trianon, which we found in a shed at the Ferme, were of the old pattern. The wood. Miss Lamont then went from the Hameau towards the small Orangerie, whilst on the ascending path she saw, on looking back, a man passing in front of, or in, a distant plantation on his way to the Amo. He was dressed in the cloak and hat we had seen the previous summer. She then descended to the low ground in front of the Belvedere and crossed one of the bridges over the principal river, not the Rocher Bridge, but possibly the Verglet Bridge. After going forward a little, she turned, meaning to go back to the Amo, and recrossed either the same bridge or the next one, which is very near the Verglet. She immediately found herself in a wood of very tall trees with such high, thick undergrowth that, even though it was winter, she could not see through it. 
well-kept paths opened at intervals right and left at different angles and they gave the impression of being so arranged as to lead round and round she had the feeling of being in the midst of crowds passing and repassing her and heard voices and sounds of dresses on looking back she found the view as completely blocked as it was in front and to the sides after vainly pursuing the confusing paths for some time she found herself close to the hill leading to the orangerie in 1904 and in 1908 we tried to find this wood without results there are open plantations but they have no undergrowths concealing paths from one another even in summer several people have gone independently to look for the wood but have not found it in 1905 miss lamont was told by the chief authority that in this direction trees had been thinned and not replaced the entries in the archives indicate that there must have been woods nearby in which paths were cut for the queen it is also likely that the older woods such as les onze arpents are not referred to for when these plantations were made thousands of lower shrubs were bought to be placed under the trees which were paid for by the king in the gardener's wages book the gathering up and occasional burnings of undergrowths in a wood apparently in this part of the garden are alluded to in meek's map seventeen eighty three the wood with its diverging paths can be plainly seen it is approached by the two bridges over the river and stretches towards the hill on which the orangerie stands the music whilst in the wood miss lamont heard sounds of a band of violins drifting past her from the direction of the house the sounds were very soft and intermittent and were lower in pitch than bands of to-day she could afterwards write down from memory about twelve bars but without all the inner harmonies she ascertained immediately afterwards that no band had been playing out of doors that afternoon at versailles it was a cold wet winter's afternoon in march nineteen o seven the twelve bars were shown to a musical expert who said without having heard the story that the bars could hardly belong to one another but that the idiom dated from about seventeen eighty he found a grammatical mistake in one bar after hearing the story he said that bands in the eighteenth century were lower in pitch than they are now he suggested the name of sacchini in march nineteen o eight miss lamont and a friend were told in versailles that no bands had been allowed to play in the park in winter until nineteen o seven they also ascertained that no music played at versailles or in the park could have been heard at trianon in the same month they searched through a great deal of unpublished music in the conservatoire de musique at paris and discovered that the twelve bars represented the chief motifs of the light opera of the eighteenth century excluding rameau and his school and that as far as they could discover nothing like them occurred in the opera of eighteen fifteen onward they were found in sacchini philidor monsigny Gretry, and pergolesi grammatical mistakes were found in monsigny and Gretry. sacchini dardanus general likeness Oedipe à colonne number six two bars intact in the key answering to that heard in nineteen o two allowing for the rise in pitch which had taken place since the eighteenth century this was proved by later editions of operatic music in which the songs were dropped a semitone to retain the original key philidor in a collection of single airs rigaudon seventeen sixty seven the cadence le maréchal ferrand repetition of single notes the first bar of the melody and many other hints of likeness duny seventeen sixty five the same general characteristics but no exact resemblance monsigny le roi et le fermier written for performance at the opening of the new theatre at the petit trianon august first seventeen eighty when the queen first acted herself up to nineteen o eight it had not been republished in it the figure of the first of the twelve bars was found le déserteur no published edition was found after eighteen thirty in one published before that date the last three bars of the music were found and the melody of the first bars was assigned to the second violins and very freely in inversions and variations in other places the character of the accompaniment was reminding thirds and sixths constantly occur in monsigny's music Gretry. the same phrases were used and the ascending passage was found also hidden consecutive fifths pergolesi largo and adante in d similar phrases were used the tall gardener miss lamont then went along the upper path and when between the escargot hill and the belvedere she met a very tall gardener of apparently great strength with long muscular arms she thought that with his long hair and grizzled untidy beard and general appearance 
He had the look of an Englishman rather than a Frenchman. He was dressed in a rough knitted jersey, and a small dark blue round cap was set at the back of his head. She inquired where she should find the Queen's Grotto, and he walked a little way beside her to show her the way. Miss Lamont expected to have to turn back to the present grotto, and when she remarked that they were going past the Belvedere, he replied firmly that they must go past the Belvedere, and said that it was necessary to have been born and bred in the place to know the way so that personne ne pourrait vous tromper. It appears that from 1870 onwards, the gardeners at Trianon have been selected from the technical schools, and that it is now a matter of competition, no one being appointed simply because he was born and bred there. We do not know whether this is the case with the undergardeners, nor whether the tall gardener was a chief official or not. In August 1908, we were told by a former gardener that their dress now is the same as the traditional dress of the Ancien Régime, namely, a rough knitted jersey with a small casquette on the head. In the old weekly wages book, there appears for several years the name Langlais, probably a nickname. He must not be confused with John Eggleton, who remained at Trianon only a few months, and whose wages were settled on his departure by a bill which is still in existence, but is not in the wages book. We owe our researches as to the position of the Queen's Grotto almost entirely to the tall gardener's decided directions and guidance to the part of the English garden between the Belvedere and the Montagne close to the theatre. E. M. F. L. September 1910. End of section 2. Read by Martha Weller, Champaign, Illinois, May 14, 2023. Section 3 of An Adventure by Charlotte Anne Elizabeth Moberly and Eleanor Jourdain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 Answers to Questions Which We Have Been Asked. 1. One of us has to own to having powers of second sight, etc., deliberately undeveloped, and there are psychical gifts in her family. She comes of a Huguenot stock. The other is one of a large and cheerful party being the seventh daughter and of a seventh son, her mother and grandmother were entirely Scotch and both possessed powers of premonition accompanied by vision. Her family has always been sensitive to ghost stories in general, but mercilessly critical of particular ones of a certain type. 2. Both of us have inherited a horror of many forms of occultism. We lose no opportunity of preaching against them as unwholesome and misleading because they mostly deal with conditions of physical excitement and study of the abnormal and diseased, including problems of disintegrated personality, which present such close analogy to those of insanity. We have the deepest distrust in, and distaste for, stories of abnormal appearances and conditions. We find narratives of revenant unconvincing, and studiously avoid, as utterly lowering, all spiritualistic methods of communication with the dead. We have never had the curiosity or the desire to help in the investigations of psychical phenomena. 3. We belong to no new schools of thought. We are the daughters of English clergymen and heartily hold and teach the faith of our fathers. 4. We are quite certain that neither of us exerted any conscious influence over the other. For though we saw much in common, yet each had independent vision. We should think it wrong either to exercise or to submit to influence of that nature. We are independent people and accustomed to stand on our own feet. 5. Our condition at the time was one of perfect health and enjoyment of a holiday in the midst of very hard work. 6. We were entirely ignorant of the history and traditions of the place and continued our conversation about other things after every interruption. We did not even know that we were in the grounds of the Petit Trianon until we saw the house. 7. At the time, Miss Lamont thought that there was something unusual about the place and was puzzled. The same idea returned to her occasionally during the following week. Miss Morrison put her feeling of oppression down to some physical fatigue in herself, and so said nothing, for we did not know one another very well at that time, were in the relation of hostess and guest and neither of us thought of enlarging on uncomfortable sensations. After some days, when Miss Morrison was writing an account of the expedition, she thought it over with care and realized that her sensations had not been caused by fatigue, but had produced fatigue. 
She became convinced that the oppression had been due to some unusual cause in the place itself, and instantly turned to Miss Lamont and said so. Miss Lamont agreed. We then discussed the man by the kiosk and the running man, but said that there was much besides which had caused dreamy depression. Miss Morrison returned to her letter and wrote down, We both think that the Petit Trianon is haunted. When we met next, three months later, we talked it over again, and finding that Miss Lamont had not seen the lady, and that Miss Morrison had not seen the plow, cottage, woman, or girl, we resolved to write separate accounts of our visit in order to find the discrepancies, but with no idea of making exhaustive histories. These papers are still in existence. Miss Lamont, in her story, used the words uncanny and eerie to describe her feelings, but they did not mean that she had the least idea at the time that any of the people encountered were unreal or ghostly. This was still more true of the scenery. 8. During the next three years, Miss Lamont repeatedly took parties of girls over the Trianon, and she reported that the place was changed, but Miss Morrison could not believe it, and even made maps to remind her what their old route had been. After Miss Morrison had paid a second visit to Trianon in July 1904, and had found out for herself that the place was entirely changed, it was resolved to undertake a personal research into the matter and to say no more until we had discovered for ourselves whether our vivid recollections of the people and the place tallied with any ancient reality or not. Up to that time, we had told the story freely, with the result that we have constantly traced it inaccurately reported in histories sometimes purporting to have come from other sources and even in newspapers and small periodicals. After research had begun to yield interesting results, we were obliged to be silent, finding that publicity prevented our getting at evidence. We are very busy people and have refused to let the incident take a prominent place in our time, interests, or fancy, though from the first we agreed to lose no given opportunity of elucidation. The evidence has, therefore, come slowly, but the manner in which it has come has often been a source of surprise. If a helpful person came in our way, we showed the whole thing. If we were casually asked if certain reports were true, we confirmed them, when we could, but said nothing further. We were anxious to wait until we had exhausted every possible means of satisfying ourselves as to the exact amount of interest attaching to the story and it was several years before we had to believe that we had seen the place as it had been a hundred years before, and as it had not been, in several important particulars, since 1835. The research had been undertaken with the idea of disproving the suggestion that anything unusual had happened, for we were resolved not to deceive ourselves or anyone else, if personal industry could prevent it. 9. In the course of the last four or five years, Miss Lamont has searched for evidence bearing on this story, either by word or picture, in the Archive Nationale, in the Library, Museum, Mairie, and Archive Departementale at Versailles, also in the Librairie Nationale, Hôtel de Ville, and in the Musée Carnavalet, and in the Conservatoire de Musique at Paris. She has poked about in French book and print shops, and must have seen a large number of the originals of the published plans, illustrations, and accounts of the place. We believe that there is not likely to be any striking documentary evidence other than we have dealt with. 10. The historical interest of the story seems to depend on the truth of the tradition that the Queen went to Trianon on October 5, 1789. We can find no negative evidence of this, but extremely little which is both affirmative and trustworthy. Madame Compin's short statement remains the basis of other people's longer and more detailed narratives. General Lafayette's full account of the day was burned by his wife during the terror. Count Fersen's memoirs were also partly destroyed. The Abbé Bossuet had Madame de Tourzel's careful history of that day burned. But in the published memoirs, she says that she was in residence that day at Versailles as gouvernante des enfants de France. She does not mention having gone to Trianon, as implied by Marion's story, but it is still possible. Most French historians now adopt Madame Compin's statement, but, in the words of one of them, with some doubts. It is worth mentioning that many later historians insert the fact, though it is not recorded by Madame Compin, that the Queen was accompanied by a single valet. Is this a tradition? 11. We do not believe in anniversaries in the usual sense, 
We have tested both our days, August 10th and January 2nd, going as far as possible, under the same circumstances, without any result at the Petit Trianon. Yet it is possible that if we entered into an act of memory, it may well have been first made on the terrible 10th of August, 1792, though the memory itself was occupied, in the central place, with the events of October 5th, 1789. The dress of the messenger was more suitable for October than August. At the same time, Vaudreuil left France the previous summer and cannot have sat in the Trianon woods after the taking of the Bastille, July 14, 1789. There is an incoherence about both the large and small incidents, which seems to require combination within a single mind, and the only mind to which they could all have been present would have been that of the Queen. Our theory of 1901 that we had entered within the working of the queen's memory when she was still alive is now enlarged we think that the two first visits to trianon august tenth nineteen o one and january second nineteen o two were part of one and the same experience that quite mechanically we must have seen it as it appeared to her more than a hundred years ago and have heard sounds familiar and even something of words spoken to her then having been for two most trying years confined to paris and excepting for a visit to st cloud through two hot summers and being in the midst of the tumultuous horrors of the great tenth of august she may as the day wore on and she grew more used to her miserable position in the hall of the assembly where she sat for eighteen hours have fancied in memory the grounds at trianon more spacious than they really were and have seen the trees as one sees trees in recollection like a picture without life, depth, or movement. In reverie, her mind may have wandered from the familiar sight of the two Berzies at the gate to the little vision of two men gathering up garden rubbish into a cart, which we know happened on October 5th, 1789, as well as one day during the last winter she spent at Versailles, and which, without any reason, had remained in her mind. She may have thought of the place as it was during that year of the meeting of the States-General, when the grounds were, for the first time, thrown completely open to the public, and intruding strangers could be seen there. Or she may have gone back to the earlier years and the pleasant afternoons when the band played on the pelouse in front of the house, and to the excitement of acting in the little theatre with her special friends, perhaps letting herself realize the unkindness of the pressure put upon her by Vaudreuil to have the acting of the Mariage de Figaro authorized how naturally the thought of him would have formed one picture in her mind with the memory of the last scene when she was hurriedly summoned from trianon never to return for she may very likely have supposed all that she was suffering to have been more exclusively the result of her own former mistakes than could have been just and have been going over them in her mind on our return to paris on the day of the original visit to trianon when undoubtedly her image was uppermost in our thoughts and the recollection of her terrible end was hardly to be endured, the recurring consolation to Miss Morrison was, she has forgiven it all now, and knows the true meaning of the French Revolution on both its good and bad sides, and also the exact proportion of her own part in it. But the act of memory which had so strangely and mechanically clung to the place, with which we had, perhaps, been associated in the grounds, was incoherent and pictorial. It was oppressive to us because it represented a more limited view of those times than after a hundred years we have learnt to take of them, and was far more limited than any thought the Queen can have about them now. 12. Our answer to the suggestion that we were in a state of suspended consciousness is that our conversation and sense of the quiet continuity of things remained unbroken, and in spite of oppression, believed ourselves to be particularly wide awake and on the alert. When we were first asked whether the man from the side building was real or not, we laughed at the idea of any unreality. All was so quietly natural that we are still uncertain whether the tall gardener belonged to another century or not. It has taken us nine years to work out all the details which bear witness to the strangeness of what we saw and did, and to justify us in our present conviction that from the moment of our leaving the lane until we emerged into the avenue, we were on enchanted ground. 13. The theory of coincidences would have to be considerably strained to cover more than 20 points quickly succeeding one another. 14. 
In the municipal records kept in the library at Versailles, there is a list of fêtes in the grounds. Miss Lamont has examined it carefully. There had been one for which people had been dressed in Louis XVI costume in June 1901, but there is a note to say that it had been confined to the Amo. There was none in August 1901. We know that since 1901, there have been fêtes in the grounds with scenes in character, so that other people may have come across them. An examination of the records as to dates would probably reveal such possibilities. In the same catalog, notices are made of photographs taken of historical groups at fêtes. There had been some in connection with the June fête, and Otto was mentioned by name. On inquiry, Otto wrote that he had not taken l'ensemble de la fête, c'était des groupes de jeunes filles et des dames séparément. Dufayel took pains to look the matter up, and Miss Lamont and one of his employees went all through his lists and books of specimen photographs and found that he had not taken any photographs at Trianon between 1900 and 1906. He recommended inquiries at Pierre Petit's, as Petit would have Lafayette's as well as other photographers' pictures. No photographs of the scenes we wanted were to be heard of there, and Pierre Petit wrote afterwards that his only photographs at Trianon had been taken in 1900 for the exhibition. It has been suggested to us that our story can be explained by people posing for a cinematograph in order to register the scene of the messenger running to the queen, while something further has been said of a girl sweeping up leaves as forming part of the group. Naturally, from the first, we had thought of some such explanation, but had rejected it as insufficient. We did not see the man running, we only heard him. Then he suddenly appeared, standing close to us, and addressed us personally, earnestly, and with excitement. As a scene, it would have been nothing. We saw no queen and no girl sweeping up leaves. He remained by us until we turned away from him. The cinematograph theory does not explain how it was that he came over and stood with his back against rocks of considerable size piled on one another when rocks have not been there for nearly a hundred years, though we find that they had been placed in that part of the garden in 1788. Nor does it explain how it was that both before and during the man's coming we were both gazing at a kiosk which is not now in existence, though both rocks and kiosk, we found out years after, to have made part of the original scenery in 1789. Not a word is hinted about the little bridge over the ravine and the little cascade close by, all being essentials both to our, and we believe, to the original story. We suspect the explanation to be simply that we had not talked about them at first, not knowing their significance till later, and so they have not got into any widely spread story. We know from the archives that the streams were not cleared from leaves after October 4, 1789, and that Mariamne is only mentioned as having been paid for work in the grounds in 1783 as one of several children so occupied. If masqueraders were posing as guards at the Porte du Jardinier, the cinematograph idea does not explain the reappearance of the old cottage close by, in its former position, as placed in Meek's map of 1783. If the part of the queen was being acted, what of the orchard of trees we saw her looking into, not now in existence? Also, what is the account of the barrier at our right hand, screening off the present view and exactly answering to the old enclosure of the Jeux de Bague? The cinematograph does not explain the man who opened the great door of the chapel, easily banging it behind him as he came out. For in 1907, the people living in the place believed that it had not been opened since the days of Louis XVI, and the keeper of the key knew that even the door of the landing had not been opened for fifteen years. How was the wall lowered, which now largely hides the great door from the terrace, and makes it necessary to go down one flight of steps and up another, whereas we saw the man coming along a level, in full view, from the moment of his opening the door until he reached us, standing on the terrace outside the window of the antichambre. A cinematograph would not explain the reappearance of the old wood in all its denseness, nor the rapid disappearance of the cart and men in an open field, nor the music which, six years later, was found to be a piecing together of eighteenth-century operas. No amount of masqueraders explains to us the ease with which we dismissed from sight and hearing 
the usual August crowds in the middle of a fine afternoon, and the impossibility of harmonizing our recollections of the scenery with anything but the old maps and records. Certainly none of the persons we met were being photographed at the moment, or we must have seen it. And had scenery been erected for the purpose, we must have observed such large artificial arrangements. There would probably have been sightseers, and presumably the fact of anything so considerable would have been in the catalogue. Even should it be proved that a cinematograph had been taken that very day, it would not be a possible explanation to us. The groups we saw were small and isolated from one another. There was the deepest silence everywhere, and no sunshine, whilst the light was the worst possible for a picture, for the sky was overcast. And though whilst we stood there, an indefinable air of strangeness dropped over everything, including the tall forest trees. It was not of a kind that could be accounted for by fictitious scenery. The people moved and spoke as usual, but their words were extraordinarily difficult to catch. In September 1910, the question of such representation was settled by an inquiry of the authorities. No leave to take cinematographs had been granted in August 1901. The FED had been on June 27th and the photographs of it had been taken sufficiently near the time to be published in the July number of Versailles Illustré. Not one of the pictures in this number is in the least like what we saw either in the matter of subjects, costumes, or places. The inaccuracy is so great that in an article in the same magazine, the scene of the messenger coming to the Queen is transferred from the Grotto to the Amo, though the sole authority for the tradition places it at the Grotto. 15. During the last five or six years, much research into topographical and archaeological details has been made by the newly formed Société des Amis de Versailles, probably from the same archives examined by Miss Lamont, so that many points of likeness to what we saw may soon reappear. Old music with old-fashioned instruments is now frequently introduced at summer fêtes at Trianon. Even the water arrangements in our part of the garden seem likely to be altered, and the little cascade may yet be seen again. At the beginning of 1910, Miss Lamont saw engineers searching for the first and second source, and in the following autumn she found iron grids placed on the ground near the positions we had allotted for them, but nothing had been altered up to September 1910. We are most curious to know whether the restorations will be exactly according to our recollections of the scenery or not. 16. Stories retailing just so much of our own, as we had first talked about, are constantly being repeated to us, some with the little additions we can recognize as our own early surmises, generally with the omission of points we did not know to be interesting until later, and often with all the muddles arising from the attempt to shorten a long story with a few unauthorized additions and explanations thrown in. These stories are told to us as being the property of persons we have never heard of, we have constantly inquired on what authority they rest, and if there is any at all, we have not infrequently been able to discover the track they have followed from us back to us again. 17. We do not think that deception explains it. If we were deceived in one, two, or three points, could we have been in all? For out of them, we have been able to reconstruct the story of Trianon in many tiny details, the truth of which we have had to discover for ourselves. 18. We are constantly asked why we, of all people, should have had such an adventure. We are equally puzzled, and have come to think that it may not be so unusual as it seems. We can imagine the people, even if they suspected anything unusual, which they might easily not do, may have thought it best not to follow it up. The peculiarity in our case may simply have been that two persons were equally able to consider the circumstances, and did do so that we found there was available evidence, and that we had the opportunity for obtaining it. 19. Certain unusual conditions were present. 1. Two people in broad daylight, good health, and normal conditions were equally able to bear witness to the facts, yet not in the manner of thought transference between each other, for they did not see alike in every point. 2. Some of the facts were so small that no historical knowledge, however dim, could have suggested them. 3. They concerned such well-known historical personages that much documentary proof as to the reality of the incidents is accessible, yet in some particulars 
they are of such a nature as to be incapable of reproduction by any tricks of scenic effects, and some of the evidence found in the archives had, to all appearance, not been disturbed since its collection by the National Assembly until Miss Lamont in 1904 undid the old fastenings that had stuck together through age and disuse. For instance, much of the evidence about the gardeners taken from the wages book. E. M. F. L. September 1910. End of section 3, read by Martha Weller, Champaign, Illinois, May 16, 2023. Section 4 of An Adventure by Charlotte Ann Elizabeth Moberly and Eleanor Jourdain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 A Reverie A Possible Historical Clue. To find the causes of the universal movement, which for convenience we call the French Revolution, one should be a trained historian, philosopher, and theologian and be able to pass in review and justly estimate the aspirations for political consolidation, greater individual responsibility, and the revolt against papal tyranny over consciences, as they had been working in all European countries for many centuries. To find the causes for the particular form which this universal development took in France, it would be necessary to weigh the moral, social, and political, including the fiscal, tendencies of earlier generations. This would be manifestly impossible in a paper dealing with the revolution in France, as it may have appeared to a single mind, on one special day, at a time of great mental excitement. There can be no doubt that Marie Antoinette was the innocent victim of a worldwide upheaval in the moments when men were first consciously developing it. And we can well believe that to herself the reasons for such reversals of older thoughts seemed inscrutable while she would have vainly sought, in reflecting over her own mistakes, for grounds sufficient to justify the enormous misfortunes which overwhelmed her personally. The 10th of August, 1792, was a marked day in the history of the French Revolution, the tide of French democratic reaction against the ever-increasing selfishness of privilege and the inability of the rulers to sympathize with a growing desire for greater freedom and less personal government had been gathering force with constantly increasing momentum, and on this day Louis the Sixteenth virtually relinquished all independence as head of the state by surrendering himself for the sake of the safety of his family and to save France from the crime of massacring its king into the doubtful care of the legislative assembly. The states general, to which that assembly was a successor, had been opened by the king in 1789 at one of the critical moments when the dissatisfaction of the nation with its financial conditions produced keen anxiety to the court, and it had, on another epoch-making day of that unrestful period, refused on June 23, 1789, to be dissolved by mandate of the king. From that moment, the National Assembly had become the center of the reforming party in France. Louis XVI, as king, did not seem to stand in the way of the wishes of the nation as expressed by the assembly. He appeared to be willing to forego more of his prerogatives than was compatible with the existence of monarchy as understood in France, but it was believed the queen was of a different opinion and desirous of upholding the ancient monarchical idea as a practical force, which at that time, in spite of the king's amiability and absence of policy, could not be otherwise than hostile to the still vague but unbounded aspirations of the Democratic Party. Madame Vito had that influence over the king due to a strong personality and her position as a much-loved wife. Upon her, therefore, fell the wrath of the nation. It was instinctively recognized that as a wife and mother she had every reason to desire the continuance of things as they were, and the people quickly interpreted every act of vacillation on the king's part to the queen's active enmity to the rising forces of democracy. It was on August 10, 1792, that the Legislative Assembly was made to realize another function belonging to it beyond that of fighting the prerogatives of the king and of the aristocracy. In such a restless age, and in such a country as France, it was impossible to suppose that the outspoken longings of philosophers, poets, and statesmen for freedom 
should not stir up the hope of freedom from all authority and restraint whatever in the lowest stratum of society the lengths to which the mob in paris could go had during the last three years shown itself on isolated occasions but with increasing frequency and savagery both mob and assembly were animated by the same desire namely to make monarchy in france absolutely helpless to withstand their will the assembly was trying to bring it about with some appearance of constitutional decency without apparently perceiving that unless the king was allowed to banish himself a discrowned monarch without any raison d'etre whatever in the country inevitably meant his ultimate and perhaps speedy disappearance by death the mob saw its policy more clearly and was ready to get rid of him and the queen by instant murder thus on the morning of august tenth the legislative assembly had the double part to play of continuing its assault on privilege whilst protecting the royal family from destruction when at some moment between seven and nine a m louis the sixteenth and marie antoinette entered the manege in which the council met there was at first some attempt at restrained courtesy showing itself in the grave assurance of protection in reply to the king's request and also in half an hour's doubt as to where he should sit down but the assembly was entirely aware of its victory in this act of unconditional surrender on the part of the king and would allow no royal guards of any description to enter there was a short alarm lest it should have to defend itself against the cannon of the insurgents the sound of firing approaching nearer to the building than the nerves of some of the deputies could sustain with calmness but the mob had not yet realized that it had the upper hand and was content to believe that the protected king was the imprisoned king and only continued to howl ferocious threats outside the grille if the assembly did not immediately see its way to the definite imprisonment of the sovereign neither did it choose that the royal party should sit on its own benches so it ordained that they should be placed in the logographie the reporter's room a sort of den not far from the president's chair open to the manege and within sight and hearing of all that passed but without dignity or decent comfort here without apparently any opportunity for resting or meals the king queen princess elizabeth madame royale and the dauphin remained until at least ten p m a few faithful attendants such as the princesse de lamballe madame de tourcel the prince de poix and the duc de la rochefoucauld were with them and at first other royalists were allowed to bring them news and to pass in and out but this was stopped in the course of the day from dufour's account it would seem that no one was busying themselves to supply their wants until he undertook to do so the next day a draught of water brought to them in their cells at night to quench their raging thirst is all that he speaks of if the story of the king eagerly devouring food in public is true and it is impossible to believe that the children had nothing yet it is doubtful whether the queen who had had no rest the night before had any food during the day what a tumult of disgust fears indignation and overwhelming regrets must have occupied the queen's mind it was difficult enough to maintain an outwardly calm queenly demeanour her thoughts must have been confused half formed reflecting the agitation of despair and anxiety she knew only too well that she was looked upon as the political enemy of the crowd for reasons that were not altogether untrue she had had a policy inconsistent with republicanism and though worsted in it the events of the last three years probably justified it in her own mind she inherited a belief in a strong rule beneficent as her own kindly nature required but one that could fight its battles and make full use of such opportunities as hereditary kingship possessed again and again she had felt that the king's action was worse than nothing marie antoinette would have sternly punished the crime of killing the king's officials she would have upheld the sovereign office as long as there were those who prized it the country could never have reached the present point of rebellion if the taking of the bastille for instance had not been condoned and the murders and outrages connected with it had not been allowed to pass without adequate punishment why were the troops dismissed so soon after and the nobles allowed to emigrate it may have been right for the monarch to urge upon some of them the danger in which they stood by remaining 
But where was their courage and loyalty in leaving the country? The sensation of loneliness was terrible. Where were the illustrious families and statesmen who had not left France, who had the Queen only known it, were to go during the next year in one long procession to the scaffold? They were, she knew, paralyzed by the King's inaction and weakness. Surely they would have rallied had he called upon them with decision to defend their rights and had placed himself at their head, even though many of those princely families who had surrounded her during the first years of her reign had been alienated and in opposition to herself before the disaffection became general. Where were the faithful Swiss guards, who only that morning had escorted them in safety to the Manege, and would have fought bravely and perhaps been the rallying point for all who were not declared Democrats? Alas, alas, the sounds of screams and fiendish massacre were in her ears at the moment. Cannon, musketry, and cold-blooded carnage were then and there destroying the last stronghold. The tiny loge, only ten feet square, so painfully hot and full of comers and goers, seemed to the despairing queen empty of all who should have been there to represent the monarchical principle. The presence of the Prince de Poix and the Duc de la Rochefoucauld and a few others who were endangering their lives by being with them only emphasized the forlornness of the royal condition. Looking from her dismal corner in the loge at the king, who sat with impassive mien facing the assembly, what waves of painful emotion must have swept across her brain? The king could not see things from her point of view, but he had loved and spoiled her. He had been faithful to her as no French monarch for many generations had been loyal to his wife. He was devoted to her and to their children, had paid her debts again and again, had ennobled and enriched her friends. His patience and magnanimity were saintly. But how often had she raged against his theory that the king's duty was to set an example of lofty forbearance and forgiveness of every injury even when done to him as representing the law, justice, and power of the whole French peoples. She had instinctively felt that had she been in the king's place, she would have found her way through the past crises without either descending from her throne or doing wrong to the most Christian charity. She knew that she was kind-hearted and had always loved to be the benefactress of others. Yes, she too could forgive royally when forgiveness was due from her in her own person, but not when it required injustice to others. But Marie Antoinette was too clear-sighted to impute all the blame of this downfall to the king's mistakes. No doubt his feeble idea had been to behave as though the Democrats only were the nation, forgetting the contrary view of those who had either banished themselves or who were perforce silent unless he could lead the way. To obey every behest of the legislative assembly and of the mob showed a lamentable lack of wisdom but even such a poor policy had brought him an undoubted though fleeting popularity. He had appeared to take the side of the opponents of monarchy. He had divested himself of prerogatives, had sworn to a constitution beyond his power to carry out, and had submitted to the indignity of placing the red bonnet on his head. But had she not helped to make all this short-sighted weakness even more unavailing than it need have been? What was the use of humbling the aristocracy along with himself and of acting against his own convictions if at the same time he consented to plans for escaping and was known to be so far untrustworthy to his own professions that at every crisis he listened to her incessant urgings to the more spirited policy by which he could instantly rally the royal forces? Bitterly she knew that she had never prevailed to overcome his fatal belief that the king was never to shed the blood of a Frenchman, even if he were a disturber of the public peace. But she had ever to bear the blame of every mistake. She thought of that terrible message sent only two hours ago at the bidding of the assembly that their guards were not to defend themselves, but to disarm. Only this morning there were six hundred Swiss and two hundred gentlemen and even companies of the National Guard whom they could trust, but whispered reports had reached even the loge that their noble supporters had died unsoldierly and cold-blooded deaths. There was no longer any nucleus in the country of loyalty to the consecrated ruler. There was nothing now to prevent the passing of the formal decree by which she heard the king suspended from his office and deprived of every vestige of authority. Though Louis XVI appeared unheeding and expressionless, 
Could she bear this indignity, this wrong to her son? Could they not escape from this wicked durance? But she had consented to this surrender to their enemies in the hope of saving her son's life. It had been the only chance, as long as they were in some shelter from the howling savages outside who were screaming for their blood, the life of her son was secure. She had long accustomed herself to the thought of being assassinated, but there was no fear of a judicial murder. No government of France would sink to such a point of wickedness and unwisdom in the face of a united Europe. They would be condemned to more years of miserable bondage, but they would be together. Friends would rally. Circumstances would clear themselves. The queen had it in her still to do and dare everything if there were any hope of surmounting the present crisis. If she might only act. But no, the queen's heart sank again as the numbing sense of helplessness came over her, remembering that she would not be allowed to act. It was always the king who had the last word. She might plan, but he, with all his love and confidence in her, invariably thwarted every attempt requiring some spirit of defiance. He had ruined the Varenne scheme by letting himself be recognized at critical moments. Why did he review the guards that morning and make it unavailing by omitting to speak words of courage and confidence? Why did he seek the protection of his enemies rather than fire on the mob, which an hour later fled away at the volleys fired by the Swiss? No, there was no hope of contending against the difficulties imposed on their party by the inertia of the king. And now things had gone so far, perhaps he had no choice but to advise obedience when the assembly decreed that the few friends outside their household who had pressed into the loge should no longer hold communication with them, but should retire. More than once during those sad hours, they had to see faithful servants bleeding and with torn clothes judged at the bar of the assembly for having defended them. The handkerchief that was handed to the queen in the place of her own, which was soaked with tears, in order that she might wipe the drops of sweat off the brow of the young dauphin, was tinged with blood. Exhausted by horror and disappointment, what strength remained to the queen must have spent itself in thoughts for her little son, who with touching obedience was trying to be bien sage avec ses vilains hommes. If she was personally helpless to save his crown, surely the kings of Europe would see to it. Again hope revived at the thought of a successful war already beginning. The false moves of the last years perhaps only meant at the worst that though she and the king had to die at the hands of an enraged but defeated France, the boy would escape. With victorious armies surrounding Paris, there would be those within who would then be roused to get the lad into the protection of friends. Surely God would help him then. But what if everything should fail? Fatality had overtaken every reasonable hope since this terrible revolution had begun. There were forces of mysterious and terrific magnitude which seemed to her to be bearing away everything that had been stable hitherto. Her ignorance of what constituted these forces increased their terror for her. During the two hours when the deputies separately repeated the words of the oath, to maintain liberty, equality, or die, the queen, in utter weariness, tried to penetrate the mystery of that fatality which seemed to overtake royalty in France, and herself in particular. Perhaps for a moment she realized that had she seriously studied history, some light might have come as to the meaning of this crushing movement. The volumes of Hume's History of England, which in early days had been carelessly listened to, conveyed little to her inattentive mind. She did not know even the history of France intelligently enough to be able to guess whether the enveloping force owed its strength to anything which could have been foreseen. Was there anyone who could have foreseen this trend of events when it was only last year that the Constitution had been applauded to the skies as the consummation of political wisdom? Was the penury of the country and the starving condition of the poor at the bottom of this earthquake? But why visit them upon the court? People must know that she and the king were most kindly and anxious and troubled for all. They had reduced every possible expense in their household. Had she not nine years ago refused the diamond necklace on account of its expense? She had not gambled in old days more than others. 
neither had she enriched her friends more than sovereigns were in the habit of doing. The Pompadours and Duberries had rolled in wealth. What was the cost of Trianon compared to the millions of money spent in building the palace at Versailles? It was unjust to make her and her children bear the punishment of the sins of former generations. Were such writers as Voltaire and Rousseau responsible in any degree for the gathering forces that were crashing all law and order as they had been hitherto understood? The Queen knew something of their views, but their invectives against kings as tyrants seemed unjust and exaggerated and had repelled her. To her mind, her mother, husband, and brothers were not selfish oppressors. They meant to be useful to their subjects and would have been unwise to have rejected the wisdom of former times embodied in traditions and old customs. Moreover, any truths uttered by Voltaire were vitiated to the Queen by his declared hostility to religion as she knew it. Such overwhelming forces as were destroying France could not be the outcome of such feeble views. There must be stronger reasons than such writings could account for. But here there was some tangle of ideas which could not be unraveled. The Queen's mind was not one to dwell on abstractions. It was wholly untrained and incapable of thinking out points of philosophical or religious argument. She could not disentangle the various points of view which distracted her mind. As the long hours went on, her sorrows, which admitted of no comfort, the strange impassiveness of the king, the sight of her weeping companions, the efforts of the children not to give trouble, and the physical suffering entailed on all alike, boxed up in this stifling hole on a hot August afternoon, filled her with maddening oppression, whilst the cold and insolent words of the hostile assembly, the unspeakable insults incessantly hurled at her by the cruel voices outside, the noise, the heat, the smells, the want of room, added to the effects of sleepless nights and absence of nourishment, must have filled her with an uncontrollable longing to get away. As the afternoon wore on with no hope of relief, black, helpless despair closed in on the mind of the tired queen. She must have felt that, if she was not to go mad, it was necessary to extricate herself from her present surroundings by at least a semi-unconsciousness of them. Her brain was on fire. Could she not force her imagination to take some rest? Even in happy times, some natural impatience in the queen's nature made it imperative to her to run away and be alone sometimes. It was at the Petit Trianon that she had found relief from tiresome restrictions, importunities of etiquette, and obsequious crowds. There, at least, she could have her own way and her love of simple pleasures and country freedom had been satisfied. If only she could fly to that beloved spot away from this horrible smell of blood what happiness it would be to her jaded spirits. Only to think of it afforded her a dim pleasure, overcoming the inevitable bitterness of the recollection. Yes, it was the Petit Trianon which of all places in France she loved best. The bare memory of its trees and grass and cool shadows brought a little refreshment. It was there that she had always found a reprieve from the stately formalities of Versailles and that she had been able to unqueen herself and be on an equality with her friends. But was there no pang as she realized that the king had practically just been deposed, and that she, by the voice of the only authority now recognized in the country, was virtually no longer queen of France? That favorite pastime of pretending to be no queen in the privacy of Trianon had been a dangerous game. Marie Antoinette, had not attempted to be on an equality with the old haute noblesse, whose absence at this moment was so deplorable, such familiarity would have lowered them in their own eyes, for their rank and consideration rested on their service to the sovereigns, and only by etiquettes rigorously kept could the princes and old nobility find their own raison d'être. With keen pain the truth flashed upon her that a thoughtless queen had done her best to undermine Cardinal Richelieu's policy in bringing the great feudal princes to squabble in small rivalries about positions at court rather than leave them to combine into factions and fight each other in wars dangerous to the state. Etiquettes had been laughed at, and the nobles superseded in her favor 
by persons without claim to the titles and fortunes lavished upon them but was it possible that such small considerations had really alienated the most powerful class in france the queen had only to recollect the restrained indignation of the comtesse de noailles those dismal years when no one attended her balls at versailles the immense offence given to the distinguished families of soubise conde rohan guemenet and all who were connected with them by her furious and undignified anger with cardinal rohan besides the murmurs of all who considered themselves wronged by their exclusion from her friendship at trianon to realize bitterly what had alienated the aristocracy from her beyond apparently hope of recall too worn and sad to pursue such painful thoughts it was a relief to let the vision of her favorite home float before her mind's eye and to remember the loyalty of her trianon servants such as antoine richard jardinier en chef who had succeeded to the post so long held by his father claude richard how loyally they had carried out her wishes and under the direction of her architect meek had altered their much-loved nursery gardens into a fashionable jardin anglais it had been delightful planning that garden and altering the arrangements and decorations of the house and grounds with her own rare good taste until scarcely any part was left bringing to mind the sojourn there of madame de pompadour but the house itself and the little menagerie with its vacherie bergerie and poulailler or of madame du berry but the formal french garden the chapel with the kitchens beyond in the stuffy dirty loge the royal family had resigned itself to a melancholy silence the dauphin was sleeping across her knee and the queen surrendered herself to a trance-like condition in which she saw again with extreme vividness and longing the place of former enjoyment she was again free opening all the gates with her own passe-partout and wandering into all the corners of the grounds the beautiful trees planted by the two richards in rich variety were she recollected in full summer foliage and she would fain have felt some breath of the cool evening air which she knew well must be blowing at that moment though not for her or she was again in the mazy wood beyond the vergolet bridge following in thought the sound of the light operatic music so often played on bright afternoons which drifted past her as she made her way along the wood paths well-known bars of monsigny's music mingled with reminiscences of Sacchini's and Gretry's operas. Was it not on an August day twelve years ago that she first acted herself in the charming little newly built theatre? It was in a play of Sedan, Le Roi et le Fermier, for which Monsigny had written music, especially for the Trianon, and with pain it was remembered that the plot of the play was the favorite one at Trianon, namely the superiority of the farmer's condition over that of the king vaudreuil had acted the part of the farmer lover to her jenny the queen's thoughts flew to another and the last acting so immediately followed by the frightful episode of the diamond necklace when outrage first touched her and personal popularity was finally lost under pressure from the comte de vaudreuil she had prevailed with the king against his better judgment to allow the mariage de figaro to be acted in paris in the following year the older version of the same play had been performed at trianon she had acted rosina the comte d'artois had taken the part of figaro and vaudreuil that of almaviva four years later the king's prophecy had come true and the destruction of the bastille had been the signal for vaudreuil's hurried flight from the country while she remembered that false friend whom she had willingly received into her most intimate circle though latterly he had often wearied her with his violent temper and importunities for more lucrative posts there was one day in that last summer at trianon shortly before vaudreuil's final departure in july which stood out every detail being imprinted on her memory she had wandered up the lane past the logement des corps de garde and had noticed on the ground near the lodge gates the old plough a reminiscence of louis the sixteenth's boyhood coming towards the porte du jardinier she had seen rodolphe and fidel berzy in the long green coats of the petite livrée of the garde they were directing some strangers these guards were special friends of hers had she not paid all expenses out of her own purse when rodolphe's children had been ill with smallpox 
Whilst passing them, she had noticed Marie-Anne Le Mignon standing near her mother on the steps of their cottage outside the enclosure. The queen calculated that the girl, who had then been fourteen years old, must now be a young woman of seventeen, and with her promise of beauty would soon marry, probably, she thought, to young Charpentier, who was already, she knew, attached to the girl. The queen's intimacy with her servants at Trianon had been a never-failing happiness, and she thought with infinite tenderness of the trouble their loyal sympathy for her must be causing them now. Passing through the gardener's enclosure and the porte d'entrée, she had come into the English garden. Advancing a few steps, she had suddenly caught sight of Vaudreuil sitting by the small circular ruine, dressed, she remembered, in the slouch hat and large cloak which had become fashionable since he had acted in such as Almaviva. He turned and looked at her, but did not rise or make the smallest gesture of recognition. It was by her own orders that at Trianon her ladies and gentlemen did not rise or put away their occupations when the queen entered a room. But she had lately become sensitive, and on this occasion she had felt his rudeness. After all, she was the queen. He was there as her honored guest, where the highest in the land desired to be and ordinary good manners required him to do more than sit still and look at her without seeming to notice her. The queen remembered her sensation of displeasure, and now her extraordinarily excited memory, which was enabling her to see Trianon again, down to the smallest details of the scenery, also revealed to her her short-sighted folly in undermining the first principles of that mutual courtesy which constitutes best court life at a time when France was on the verge of an immense political whirlpool. Yes, it was on that very same spot that the messenger came to her, a few months later, to announce the crowd of disaffected women from Paris en route for Versailles. She could never forget that October morning, for from that time her life had entirely altered in character, and the queen had endured a weary round of perpetual and open insult. Throughout the preceding summer, the grounds at the Petit Trianon which had formerly been so jealously guarded even from the court, had been thrown open to the public, and in order to take the chance of walking there in any privacy, the queen had lately been in the habit of driving over during the morning. That 5th of October had been fairly fine during the early hours, and she remembered having seen the gardeners at work in the different parts of the gardens, and on her way from the Temple de l'Amour to the Amo, she had passed the Prairie, and had seen two laborers in their picturesque brown tunics and colored chaperon rouge filling a hired cart with sticks crossing the vergelet bridge she had approached the cavernous mouth of her favorite grotto over which ivy fell in graceful wreaths for the first time in her experience she had noticed that the little stream issuing from the grotto had not been cleared but was choked with dead autumn leaves this unusual and forlorn sight had remained in her mind here she had sat for a time, looking at the place now deserted by all who had formerly been with her there, and as was inevitable at that time of political anxiety, became engrossed in mournful anticipations of further troubles. They had pressed more than she could bear, and feeling a sudden desire to speak to someone, she had entered the moss-lined grotto. Passing the point on her left hand, where the little cascade entered from above, she climbed the rock staircase leading to the upper opening near the porte d'entrée coming out upon the elevated rocks she called to marie anne le magnon whose father's cottage was not far off fancying that she heard the girl running to her the queen had turned and was surprised to see instead of the girl a garçon de la chambre who in a state of great agitation handed her a letter from m de saint priest a minister at the palace her memory recalled the look of that man also in the fashionable spanish hat and cloak flying over one of the upright rocks placed near the path by her orders he had been so anxious that she should wait at the house whilst he fetched the carriage that she relinquished her first thought of hurrying back by the woods and she turned instead to go to the little bridge which crossed the tiny waterfall how fond she was of that little rustic bridge which she had placed high up on the rocks hiding the theatre and surrounded by tuyas and pine trees it had been one of the most charming of her inventions and in fancy the queen again saw every step of the way and the trickling stream pouring over the rocks at her right hand amidst ferns and moss on its way into the grotto below the bridge sitting under the north terrace near the door leading from the house to the jeu de bague 
she had reopened and reread the minister's letter whilst waiting for the carriage womanlike the queen remembered that the dress she had been wearing that morning was one of the light skirts repaired during that summer the green silk bodice made in july a large white fichu and a straw hat at that moment two of the many strangers who now came in as they liked passed her by and even went up to the terrace behind her by the staircase at her left hand the queen knew that her concierge bonfoy du plan was informed that she was there and would certainly on seeing them from his attic window over the chapel send someone to ask them to go further from the house it might not have been wise but her old servants had done all they dared to protect her privacy she had before now when wandering about alone heard the coldness and unconcern with which the bursey brothers had directed strangers in the grounds just as she had expected a moment later the queen had heard the slam of the chapel door and had thought that lagrange would probably conduct them into the avenue by the passage of the porte de la menagerie that being the nearest way out of the gardens the carriage was ready and the moment had come for rallying her force to act the part of a true queen in whatever circumstances were before her the vivid dream was over and in proportion as her retrospect was concerned with more important matters the details stood out less clearly in her mind there was no refreshment in going over the events of the rest of that day though some of them came back to her in rapid succession the hurried return of the king from hunting at moudon the councils the variations of policy the presence of a rough and alarming-looking crowd on the place d'armes the free fights the deputation of women escorted by mounier on the part of the assembly then the final ordering of the carriages too late for escape the heavy depressing rain from four p m onwards which at last helped to clear away the crowd the arrival at midnight of lafayette and his national guard all had been confusing and miserable but agitating as the fifth had been there was no comparison between it and the tension of october sixth the queen remembered that she had only gone to bed that morning at two a m in order that her ladies might have some rest but for herself there was none both on october sixth seventeen eighty nine and now on august tenth seventeen ninety two outside disturbances had begun at five a m amidst the glories of a perfect summer dawn but on the former occasion it had been first realized in one of her own suite of rooms she had heard the sounds of actual fighting close to her bedroom and the hasty shout of the guards sauve la reine informed her of their deadly peril the escape to the king's room and the gathering of the family together was quickly effected but the comfort of the reunion had been followed by terrible hours when lafayette had done his utmost to quell the fury of the mob there had been amongst it a company of as it seemed veritable fiends come from no one knew where whose faces were terrible to look at it was they who enacted the horrid scene of beheading the two murdered guards varicourt and de chute under the royal windows in the cour de marbre and until they marched off to paris carrying with them the two decapitated heads on spikes it was impossible to come to any terms with the mob but after their departure by lafayette's wish which at that time amounted to command first the king and then the queen had ventured on to the balcony and had been greeted with some warmth and now three years later they had not the protecting influence of lafayette to depend on nor even the doubtful friendship of mirabeau the mob had gained the upper hand and seemed to be altogether composed of wild beasts thirsting for blood who would save them from the horrible crowd pressing against the grille it had not been without relief that marie antoinette had just heard the decree passed to keep them in the building where they were for the night but what afterwards clearly they were not to go back to the tuileries the mention of the luxembourg palace was interesting still more so the arguments of the opposition that it contained dangerous subterranean passages and opportunities for escape the queen's brain was eagerly at work again and intensely conscious of the present but madame royale and the dauphin had borne all they could and at seven p m madame de tourzel was allowed to see the accommodation being prepared for the party in the cells of the ancient couvent des Foyons. it was not till ten p m that they were escorted thither by representatives of the assembly but for the elders it was neither to rest nor to sleep 
for they were still within sound of the fierce mob outside, as well as of the distant hum of the all-powerful assembly about to decree their immediate destination. Three more weary days and nights, spent in much the same manner, were forced upon the unhappy family before they were conducted to the temple, and to what proved to be for the majority of them the Valley of the Shadow of Death. E. M. November 1908 End of section 4, read by Martha Weller, Champaign, Illinois, May 17, 2023. Section 5 of An Adventure by Charlotte Ann Elizabeth Moberly and Eleanor Jourdain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Prefatory Note The following statement received by the authors from Professor Sir W. F. Barrett, F.R.S., is published with his sanction and seems to form an appropriate introduction to the appendix. Quote, the authors of this book have given me an opportunity of reading the narratives which they independently wrote shortly after their strange experience, and also have submitted to me a large collection of letters from various friends to whom they related the occurrence the same year. From the perusal of these documents, no doubt whatever is left in my mind that the story was written substantially as it appears in this volume and told to many persons very soon after the authors had experienced this remarkable collective hallucination. End quote. W. F. Barrett, Kingston County, Dublin, October 28, 1912. Appendix. It is in response to the inquiries of many friends about an adventure that we give the following additional details. Two accounts of the expedition to the Petit Trianon in August 1901 were written independently by each of us when we discovered that, though she had been so near us and there was so little else to look at, we had not both seen the lady. Of these four accounts, A1 and 2 are dated November 25th and 28th, 1901 and were written for the purpose of finding out whom we had seen in common, with the result that the woman and girl and cottage were discovered to have been seen only by one of us. The original manuscripts of A1 and 2 are still in existence. B1 and 2 accounts were of a more descriptive character and were written for those who had not seen the place. For from the first moment of our return to England, we had talked freely about the experience to our friends and they had asked many questions. B1 was dated November and B2 December 1901. It will be seen that the narrative in An Adventure was chiefly taken from these. It was not until 1904, on discovering the changed aspect of the grounds, that we attached any special importance to B1 and 2 papers. They were copied, with introductory sentences, into a manuscript book in 1906 and then destroyed. They are reproduced here as they were written with their footnotes. No other versions were made. The story was told to many people, nearly 40 of whom have written testimonies to the fact. These testimonies range in date from October 1902 to September 1910, and many of the writers state that they heard the story much earlier, some as early as August 1901. Many also add the fact that the narratives told to or seen by them were not only complete and identical with those published in An Adventure, but that the historical investigations had either not begun or were incomplete. By far, the larger number of the corroborative data came to light after 1906. Some of our friends took part in the research, whilst the presence of one of the last witnesses of the series is vouched for at the finding of several most important facts in September 1910. These testimonies, together with much of our correspondence with each other and with friends during the years of research, are preserved. Before our original visit to the Petit Trianon, we had made no study whatever of the subject or the period, not even from guidebooks, and our ignorance of the place and of the people who had formerly inhabited it could hardly have been deeper than it was in August 1901 and January 1902. The collection of evidence fairly covering the ground has taken a long time and is not yet over. The index of dates shows how slowly the historical proofs have been gathered together. At first, the points were merely indications and could not be taken as complete without further confirmation and examination. To this class of evidence belongs the discovery that the scenery agreed with historic fact. During the first years, 
we only collected scattered facts about the place, but in the later years we could not help being aware that the extraordinary confirmation of detail was becoming important, and we were completely alive to the responsibility of having collected it. We published it with great hesitation, but with a growing conviction that the whole thing had become too large to keep to ourselves, and that it was the only means of keeping the story intact and correct. At the moment of seeing them, there was nothing specially to remark about the dresses. At that time, neither of us had any intimate knowledge of France, and the quiet green uniforms of the guards were thought to be the usual costumes of those in charge. The other dresses were accepted as foreign. We observed them carefully, but not critically, as we found out that point after point was incompatible with present conditions, and also, strange to say, with pictures of earlier costumes and such guidebook maps as we could discover, our critical attitude became definite. We spared no pains to investigate every detail of the experience. These details had been written down years before and were being freely discussed by our friends who heard our reports year by year. We think it is interesting that the persons we saw were all, apparently, in undress, and it may be for that reason that we can find no pictures which exactly reproduce the costumes which we saw. The guards were not in ceremonial dress. They seemed to have been in the petite livre, which from the fact that they formed part of the corps des gardes, commanded by the Comte d'Artois, was probably some shade of green. The coats were shaped uniforms, but rather longer and simpler than those of the royal household, of which we have since seen illustrations. We now know from written sources that the Queen had a dress of the kind described, and it is likely that on driving over to Trianon, of a morning during that sad time, as one historian says, to cry quietly, she would have worn some such dress rather than the smart skirt over hoops, with one of the gaily decorated, wonderfully shaped hats seen in books of costume. Our impression of the chapel man was that he came to us in such a hurry that he had not had time to put on his coat. All we can remember of his clothes is that they were extremely plain, tight, and dark, especially the sleeves, but we did not notice details and do not agree about the color. One of us thought it was black, the other called it dark brown. The effect was of something unfinished. The running man and the man by the kiosk were not in the Trianon livery, scarlet and gold, in which even the king often came to visit the queen and which was required of gentlemen on most occasions, and also formed the livery of all the Queen's domestic men-servants, both at Versailles and at Trianon. But we have learnt since that it was not invariably required when gentlemen accidentally walked in the grounds. The two men were in the newest fashion worn by private persons in 1789, but in no sort of uniform. About Christmas 1901, we saw pictures of gentlemen's dress at Versailles of a rather earlier date, probably Louis the Fifteenth. The dress consisted of cloaks, large hats, and swords, but the cloaks were shorter and the hats were plumed and less simple than those we saw. Since the publication of this book, we have found an illustration of the exact cloaks and hats. They are in an old engraving of Harlequin's disguise exposed. Wagner's print, Venice, 18th century. The cloak is ample and long, and the hat large, soft, and plain. One thing has emphasized itself in the course of the examination. We saw no one apart from some appropriate scenery in which he or she had once acted. The guards at the gate and the woman and girl had their natural background in the Porte du Jardinier, which is still there, and the cottage standing close by. The running man and the rock in front of which he stood appeared together. The other man was not apart from the kiosk by which he had once sat. The lady was near some former entrance to the terrace and the ancient jeu de bague, and she was sitting under the shade of many trees collected in orchard-like fashion on the pelouse, though none of this is usually visible. The man from the chapel came out of the accustomed door by the ancient terrace, which no one living at Trianon has seen, and we believe that he took us to the road by which people had formerly passed from the French garden to the avenue. We cannot divide the people from their surroundings. The window of the antichambre, out of which we were told in 1910 the queen was in the habit of passing into the French garden, was unshuttered, and we were just going to look in at this window when the man from the chapel called to us, but the front windows looking into the English garden were shuttered. Yet a few minutes later, 
we went over the rooms in company with a large party, which proved that it was not because it was after the hours for showing people over the house that the windows were shuttered, but it might have been because in the circumstances in which we saw them from outside, there was no one in residence. The many words we use to describe our sensations, taken separately or all together, do not cover the actual impression made on us at the time, and if any one word is pressed, it becomes misleading, such as dreaminess, when it is interpreted to mean definite sleepiness. Even the expression, walking as in sleep, did not mean sleepiness, but recalled the peculiar sensation, sometimes felt in sleep, of not being able to cover the ground quickly. So far from our having been absent-minded, we remember our easy conversation at the time, whilst the want of exact knowledge of the way had made us increasingly alert and attentive to the contour of the ground and the background of scenery. We did not sit down anywhere in the grounds or in the house, but were walking briskly forward all the time, except for the moments when we spoke to the guards and the running man delayed us. If the curiously changed look of things in the midst of continuity during an eclipse of the sun is remembered, the expression, everything looked unnatural, therefore unpleasant, will be understood. If some such impression was felt for about half an hour in a shady place, full of trees, on a fine afternoon without sunshine, it would enhance, without any startling sense of incongruity, the deepening oppressive stillness, and it might easily be mistaken at the moment for some personal inability to see things freshly and brightly, if either of us had guessed that the other was feeling the same thing, or if it had lasted longer, we might have spoken of it at the time, and when a few days later the idea of haunting first occurred to one of us, we instantly spoke of it to one another. There are historical points still needing confirmation. Something, we know from Meek's map and the marks on the wall, was built outside the gardener's yard, but we have not yet discovered whether it was the cottage with sideways steps upon which the woman and girl were standing. We know where the Petite Ruine d'Architecture, placed on the oldest grotto, and the Ruine formant la naissance de la rivière, probably stood, and we have found out what was the cost of the latter compared with the Temple de l'Amour and the Belvedere, but we have seen no pictures of it, though we have hunted in many collections both in England and France, and people have very kindly lent us old family sketchbooks of that period. A rough drawing was made of it in 1904 from memory, when we failed to find the kiosk, and this is still in existence, but nothing has been discovered to justify that memory beyond written records. We have seen no picture of the rock in front of which the man stood, nor can we find any trustworthy illustration showing the steps up to the terrace by the Jeux de Bag, Maps and marks on the wall suggesting the possibility are all that we have. Though we know now of the former existence of the little bridge and of the miniature cascade which passed through the Queen's Grotto, it does not surprise us that there is no trace of either in Meek's plan, for the bridge and ravine over which it passed must have been so small compared to the large bridge over the open lake, which we call the Rocher Bridge, that they could hardly have been entered on a map of such small dimensions. Their respective sizes, as well as the fact that one was over the open lake and the other in a confined position on high ground, completely distinguished these bridges from one another and also from the other bridges that are still on the low meadow ground over the winding stream. We still have to learn whether the carriage road was, as we believe we saw it, open to the sky or, as the authorities on the spot suggest, a closed passage having doorways at either end. The first of the old maps appended is dated vers 1780, but the Belvedere was not finished until the following year. All the parts that have come out dark represent green, either trees or grass. The masses of trees planted in the pré of the English garden were planted in 1784 to 1786, this point was discovered by us in the archives in 1908. The map is therefore earlier than the planting of the trees on the Peleuse. It is also earlier than the building of the stables. There is only a green pathway between the buildings of the cuisine and kitchen garden beds. We first saw this map in 1906. The dates of the various constructions were Jeux de Bague, 1775, Ruine formant la naissance de la rivière, 1776 or 1777, Petite Ruine d'Architecture, 
was placed on the first grotto, 1777, Temple de l'Amour, 1778, Belvedere begun, 1779, Théâtre finished, 1779, Petite Rivière, the Queen's Grotto, and Ravin du Petit Pont, planned June 1780, begun August 1780, Deuxième Pont venant du côté de la Grotte, Rocher Bridge, begun September 1780, all finished December 1780, Belvedere finished 1781. The second map bears the name of Canton de la Motte, but we have always called it Meek's Map because we were told that it represented his plans for the gardens fully carried out in 1783. In 1909, it was pronounced to be the only authoritative one, and in 1910, the authorities told us that it was exact. The stable buildings are seen in it divided from the courts of the cuisine by a road. The number five occurs twice in the plan. One is on the right of the Belvedere, marking the Escargot Grotto, which probably dates from 1781, and the other to the left of the Belvedere and the Long Bridge, exactly where the opening of the cavern is seen in Lepinas's picture of 1783. Both maps are earlier than the Amo. We first saw Meek's map in 1907 and had it photographed and enlarged in 1908 in order to study it more closely. The third map belongs to the time of Louis-Philippe and shows that the road between the stables and kitchens had by that time been built over and that the present wall from the northwest corner of the terrace to the French garden had been placed. It also shows the grotto destroyed and cut up into the mounds with trees and shrubs separated from one another by tortuous paths, which are probably the same as are to be found now. Many of the ornamental arrangements of the Queen's private gardens were only in existence for about 16 years, or even less, at a time when the public and even the court were excluded. Immediately after the Queen's death in 1793, her special grotto, with its little ravines and the trees and rocks placed above it, was demolished, no exact recollection of their position having been retained, as far as we can discover. Such contemporary writers as Desac, Arthur Young, the Prince de Ligne, and Caramazine are quite vague and general in their accounts. Louis-Philippe made many more changes, and unless the place had been actually seen in its old conditions, the very meager statements in the archives and elsewhere would not, we think, have told enough to have enabled us to reconstruct it. Years in which points were discovered. 1901, December. Old picture of Versailles in an earlier reign. Trees cut flat, but we saw flattened effect rather than trees cut flat. Gentleman's dress, consisting of cloak and round hat, not exactly what we saw in 1901. Ladies' dress, gathered skirts, hats, fichu, all too much in full dress, with smart appearance. 1902. January. Kiosk, neither the Temple de l'Amour nor the Belvedere. 1902 or 1903. Muller's picture of the Queen. First heard of Comte de Vaudreuil and that he was a Creole and marked by smallpox. 1904. Algazil's dress in Barbier de Seville at Comédie Française, the same as the guards in 1901, except for red stockings. Almaviva dressed in large hat and cloak. Green uniforms not now worn at Trianon. Picture of cottage resembling the one seen in 1901, not in the right position. Neither the kiosk, rock, little bridge, nor cascade to be found. No staircase to the terrace in the right position. No broad road from French garden to the avenue. Man and cart hired for gathering rubbish in the grounds, plus un homme, required in January 1789. 1905. No plow now kept at Trianon. An old plow used by Louis XVI as Dauphin was kept at Trianon throughout his reign and sold at the Revolution. Side building found to be the chapel. 1906. Description of guard's dress under Louis XVI. Officers did not wear red stockings or embroidery. Erection of some kind behind the Belvedere. 
No waterfall recognized by dwellers at Trianon except an occasional rush of water in the winter under the Rocher Bridge. No little bridge on high ground known of. Chapel found to be inaccessible from the French garden. First heard of supposed position of the Porte de la Menagerie. Picture of bourgeoisie of 14th century wearing tunic and short cape. Trees said to have been thinned where the wood was seen in 1902. 1907. Picture procured of the plow of Louis XVI. Description of the Pont Rustique surmounting mountainous rocks. Description of the water in the Queen's Grotto. Description of the crevice in the grotto from which the prairie was visible. Madame Lavergne's account of the scene with the messenger on October 5, 1789, and of the Petite Cascade in the Queen's Grotto. Monsieur Charpentier was Jean de Lot. Marion would have been 14 in 1789. Her mother died between 1789 and 1793. Chapel doors said to have been closed for 15 years. Chapel stairs said to have been broken down for 10 years. Continuous passage from the kitchens to the house no longer in existence. Marks found on the outside of the wall of Chapel Courtyard showing where it was probably raised. Chapel Courtyard said to have been enlarged, possibly by the inner wall having been removed. Musical idiom approximately dated. 1908. Plows in France have altered in character this century. No plow amongst the list of implements bought for the Petit Trianon from 1780 to 1787. Comte d'Artois, colonel of Swiss guards, and the whole corps de garde had a green livery. Description of the Petite Livrée. Two Bercy brothers were the guards at the Porte du Jardinier, October 5, 1789. Bercy's were Garçon Jardinier de la Chambre and were stationed near La Pepiniere Proche de la Maison. Cottages found within first enclosure, right type, wrong position. Building against outer wall found in the map of 1783. Paper found describing La Ruine formant la naissance de la rivière, having seven ionic columns, walls, and dome roof. Also the cost of it, showing that it was distinct from and smaller than the Temple de l'Amour and the Belvedere. History procured of making the grottoes. Mention of the ruine and the deuxième source on the same path as the one which went across the conduit en bois. Mention of the ravin du petit pont. Mention of the petite ruine d'architecture placed by Meek in 1777 above the first grotto. Cloaks not now worn by men at Versailles. Broad-brimmed hat was the height of fashion, 1789. Mariam was paid wages for gathering up leaves in 1783. The marriage certificate of Alexandre Charpentier, 1823, procured, showing that his mother's name had been Marie-Anne Le Maignan. Magny and Le Mongain mentioned as gardeners in the wages book. The grounds have been open to the public since 1870. Court Almanac of 1783 mentions de Bretagne as a queen's page de l'écurie. Old diagram showing the possible position of small bridge. Rock placed by the path between the Ruine and the Deuxième Source. Quantities of trees bought during the years 1784 to 1786 for planting in the Pré of English Garden. Pelouse parsemé d'arbres after the theater was built and the little old comédie had been removed from the Pelouse. Queen's dress identified. Trianon Gardens were first opened to strangers May 1789. Change of masonry beyond the terrace to the end of present extension of wall. Mark of inside wall of chapel courtyard found on the chapel. Tunic and short cape worn by artisans in 18th century. Art de couleur, dress of working men at the Petit Trianon, 1789. The wood noticed in Meek's map. The gardeners were all at work in the grounds October 5, 1789, showing that it was not wet weather. Cart for removing garden rubbish was part of the regular annual expenses. Cart and two horses hired on October 4, 1789 for three days. No tunic or short cape worn now at the Petit Trianon. Undergrowth in a wood on that side of the garden cleared away. No bands allowed to play in the park in winter until 1907. 
the music found to contain motifs used in the French light opera of the 18th century. Dress of the gardeners in 1789 said to be much the same as at present. 1909. Circular mark of a possible building behind the Belvedere found in a map of 1840. Name Le Kiosk found on 1898 edition of 18th century map near the Belvedere but apparently not indicating it. Wigs out of fashion 1789. Natural hair unpowdered Monsieur de Valence first time 1788. Steel buckles in fashion 1789. Meek's map said to be authoritative, showing former existence of carriage road. 1910. Mark on wall showed where the cottage might have been. Etymology of kiosk, first admitted to the French Academy in 1762. Extension of wall from the corner of terrace found to be of rubble. Bush in the place where the lady sat was planted during the Orleans residence. The terrace above the Queen's Passage to the chapel said to have been de plein pied. Present tree planted in the center of chapel courtyard later than the monarchy. First French authorities said that Meek's map was exact as to position of old carriage road. Marks of the opening of carriage road found on both sides of kitchen buildings. Stones of carriage road laid differently from those on either side of it in the French garden. 1911. The cloaks and hats of the two gentlemen, as seen in 1901, shown in Wagner's print, Venice, 18th century, of Harlequin's disguise exposed. Gardeners now wear a capi with red band, so that the tall gardener with a round blue cap may not have been modern. 1912. A plow without wheels was noticed by Dr. Rigby in his letters from France in 1789 as old-fashioned, but still in use in Burgundy. Pointed spades were used in the time of Louis XVI. The queen had difficulty with her sight and was in the habit of holding out print and writing at arm's length and of varying the position for the sake of the focus. Three window sills on the garden side of the kitchen buildings, in the place where the road passed through, project differently from those on either side. A1. November 25th and 28th, 1901. Miss Morrison's account of the visit to the Petit Trianon. On Saturday, August 10, 1901, Miss Lamont and I went to Versailles from Paris. It was nearly four o'clock in the afternoon when we left the palace to find the Petit Trianon. By going straight down the Central Avenue at the back of the palace, we probably went the longest way. When we turned off to the right hand, we walked through a wide woodland glade, very pretty and very much deserted. The weather had been very hot for some time, and we congratulated ourselves on having a gray day for our expedition. It was still very warm, but the sky was a little overcast and the sun uncertain and mostly shaded. There was a lively air blowing, full of summer scents, and the woods were looking their best. The walk was most enjoyable, and we were both feeling particularly vigorous. When we started, our minds were full of the German occupation, but we soon began talking about our mutual acquaintances in England and paid but little attention to our surroundings. We reached a broad drive which crossed our glade and saw in front of us, a little to the left, a building which we believed to be the Grand Trianon. We did not go to it, but looked about for the Petit Trianon. Instead of asking the way, as I expected her to do, from a woman who was shaking a cloth into the drive from the doorway of a building on the right hand, Miss Lamont crossed the drive and went down a country lane in front of us. This was done so decidedly that I thought she knew the way. We followed the lane some way, but fancying we were going too far, we made a sharp turn to the right, past some deserted buildings which we thought at first might be the house we were looking for. We looked in at some doors, but did not do more, as no one seemed to be there. Then we walked on again by a slightly ascending path with rough ground on one side. Seeing two men further on, we went up to them and asked the way. They appeared to be gardeners, as one had a spade, dressed in grayish-green coats and small three-cornered hats. They directed us straight on. We walked on briskly, talking as before, but from the moment we left the lane, an extraordinary depression had come over me, which, in spite of every effort to shake off, steadily deepened. There seemed to be absolutely no cause for it, and I was anxious that my companion should not discover the sudden gloom that became quite overpowering on reaching the point where the path we were following joined another path, crossing it from left to right. 
In front of us was a slope leading down to a stream, which on our right hand fell over stones and was crossed by a rustic bridge. To our left, beyond the slope, stood the erection which later we found to be the Temple de l'Amour. I said, I wonder which is our way, and thought instantly after, nothing will induce me to go to the left. Everything looked unnatural and therefore unpleasant. Even the woods behind the temple seemed to have become flat and lifeless, like a wood worked on tapestry. There was a man sitting on the balustrade of the temple, who turned his head and looked at us. That was the culmination of my vague distress. It gave way to a moment of genuine alarm. His face was most repulsive, and he seemed to scowl. It was with real relief that we heard at that moment someone running up to us in breathless haste, and connecting the sound with the gardener's, I turned and ascertained that there was no one coming behind us, but suddenly perceived a man close to us, apparently coming over the rock, or whatever it was, that filled the corner at the divergence of the path to the left. He was a tall, handsome man, with dark eyes and crisp, curling black hair under a large sombrero hat. His face was very red, and I thought to myself, how sunburnt you are, adding immediately the thought, it is not the color of sunburning. He smiled and looked secretly amused. He had a black coat wrapped across him like a scarf, one end flying out in his prodigious hurry. Though I could not follow the words he said, there was no doubt about his intense eagerness that we should not go to the left, but should go to the right. As this fell in with my wish, I went instantly towards the bridge, turning my head to join in with Miss Lamont's expression of gratitude. By doing so, I was able to see that he was on neither path nor on the slope, but I did not think about it at the time. Very soon after crossing the little bridge, we came in sight of the back and side of the house, a square, well-built stone house with a raised terrace. The long windows at the back of the house were shuttered, and in front of them, under the balustrade, a lady was sitting on a seat on the lawn, apparently sketching or reading. I thought... After all, we were not so much alone as we had fancied. She seemed busy and was leaning forward, but when we passed on her left hand, she turned her head and looked at us. It was not a young face, and though rather pretty, it was not attractive. She had a shady white straw hat, somewhat perched on a good deal of fair hair. Her light summer dress was arranged in handkerchief fashion on her shoulders, and there was a little line of either green or gold near the edge of the handkerchief. Her dress seemed to be short in front, but as she was sitting carelessly, I cannot be sure of this. For the same reason, I perceived no distinction about her figure. She had a sheet of paper in her hand, and I had an impression that there was nothing on it. There was something unattractive about her expression, and after looking full at her, I suddenly turned away. We went on to the terrace, and as we stood there, I saw her again from behind, and noticed that her muslin fichu behind was pale green. I believed her to be a tourist, and wondered that anyone could sit in such a dreary place that still seemed to be full of unnatural darkness, and was relieved that Miss Lamont did not suggest inquiring the way from her. A young man came out of a garden doorway and told us that we could only enter the house from the front courtyard, and directed us down another path parallel with the one on which we had met the gardeners. He looked amused as he walked with us. Finding that we had to get back to the avenue, I wondered why the gardeners had made us come such an unnecessarily long way round. We soon came to the opening leading into the drive that went past the front entrance. We went over the house in company with a large merry French wedding party, and the interest of the rooms made me put aside the thought of the garden experiences. We drove back to Versailles for tea, both of us rather silent, but not mentioning the Trianon at all. We looked about for the tennis court and then went back to Paris by train. For several days we never mentioned these things, nor did I think of them until I was writing home a descriptive letter of all our expeditions, amongst others that to the Petit Trianon. As the scenes came back one by one, the same extraordinary sensation of being closed in and of deathly stillness came back so strongly that I stopped writing and said to Miss Lamont, Do you think the Petit Trianon is haunted? Her answer was prompt. Yes, I do. I begged her to say how and where, and on hearing almost an exact replica of my experience, we discussed it together, and then I realized for the first time the theatrical appearance of the man who came behind us, the inappropriateness of the wrapped cloak on a hot August afternoon, the unaccountableness of his coming and going, and the excited running. 
That was all then, but in the following November, Miss Lamont and I met again, and recalling the incidents, I mentioned the lady as a person we might have referred to for direction, and learned to my amazement that my companion had seen no lady. This was quite unaccountable, for we were walking side by side, she was visible some way off, we passed her close by, and I had seen her again from the terrace. Only my belief that she was an ordinary person had caused me not to mention her before. November twenty fifth, 1901. Note well. During our stay in Paris, we visit the conciergerie prisons, and though they were full of sad impressiveness, there was no such feeling about them as we experienced at the Trianon. All was fresh and clear and perfectly natural. A. 2. Miss Lamont's Account of the Incidents. Written before seeing Miss Morrison's account. On Saturday, August tenth, 1901, Miss Morrison and I went to Versailles. After spending some time in the palace, we went down by the terraces and struck to the right to find the Petit Trianon, tracing our way by Baydecker's plan. We walked for some distance down a wooded alley, and then came upon the buildings of the Grand Trianon, before which we did not delay. We went on in the direction of the Petit Trianon, but just before reaching what we knew afterwards to be the main entrance, I saw a gate leading to a path cut deep below the level of the ground above, and as the way was open, and had the look of an entrance that was used, I said, Shall we try this path? It must lead to the house. And we followed it. To our right we soon saw some farm buildings looking empty and deserted. Implements were lying about. We looked in but saw no one. The impression was saddening, but it was not until we reached the crest of the rising ground where there was a garden that I began to feel as if we had lost our way and as if something were wrong. There were two men there in official dress, greenish in color, with something in their hands. They told us, in answer to my inquiry, to go straight on. I remember repeating my question, because they answered in a casual way, but we only got the same answer in the same manner. We walked on. The path pointed out to us seemed to lead away from where we imagined the Petit Trianon to be, and there was a feeling of depression and loneliness about the place. We passed a building like a farmhouse. I saw a woman and girl come out of it. The girl had a mug in her hands. At last we came upon a path crossing ours, and saw to our left a building, which we afterwards recognized as the Temple de l'Amour. Seated below the balustrade on the steps was a man with a heavy black coat round his shoulders and a slouch hat. At that moment the eerie feeling which had begun in the garden culminated in a definite impression of something uncanny and fear-inspiring. The man slowly turned his face. His expression was very evil and yet unseeing, and though I did not feel that he was looking particularly at us, I felt a repugnance to going past him. But I did not wish to show the feeling, which I thought was meaningless, and we talked about the best way to turn and decided to go to the right. As we walked, I found myself wondering whether anyone had ever stumbled over from the path into the water on our left. Suddenly we heard a man running behind us. He shouted, Mesdames, Mesdames, and when I turned he said, in an accent that seemed to me unusual, that our way was to the right, not the left. Though we were surprised to be addressed, we were glad of the direction, and I thanked him. The man ran off with a curious smile on his face. The steps ceased as suddenly as they had begun not far from where we stood. I remember that the man was young-looking, with a florid complexion and rather long dark hair. I do not remember the dress, except for an impression that the material was dark and heavy. Almost immediately we came upon the garden front of the Petit Trianon, and though I remember drawing my skirt away as if someone were there, when we came out to the steps of the terrace, and then wondering why I did it, I do not remember seeing anyone until a boy came out who directed us to go round to the other entrance. On our way we passed through a garden, part of which was walled in by trees. The feeling of dreariness was very strong there, and continued till we actually reached the front entrance to the Petit Trianon and looked round the rooms in the wake of a French wedding party. Afterwards we drove back to the palace. The impression returned to me at intervals during the week that followed, but I did not speak of it till Miss Morrison asked me if I thought the Petit Trianon was haunted, and I said yes. Then, too, the inconsistency of the dress and behavior of the men with an August afternoon at Versailles struck me. Since then I noticed that the impression of the time spent in the garden of the Petit Trianon does not recur to me naturally, 
but can only be recalled by an effort. I now recollect it clearly, chiefly because I have fixed the memory of it by speaking of it and by writing down the facts. Otherwise, I should have lost the detail and only remembered the strange impression produced. But at the time, the details were so clear that I never thought of suspecting anything unreal in the occurrences. November 28, 1901. B1. November to December, 1901. Miss Morrison's account of her visit to the Petit Trianon in 1901. After some days of sightseeing in Paris, to which we were both almost strangers, in August 1901, Miss Lamont and I went to Versailles. We sat down in the Salle des Glaces, and I suggested our going to the Petit Trianon. Looking in the map, we saw the sort of direction, and that there were two Trianons, and set off. By not asking the way, we went an unnecessarily long way round, by the great flights of steps from the fountains and down the central avenue as far as the head of the long pond. The weather had been very hot all the week, but on this day the sky was a little overcast and the sun shaded. There was a lively wind blowing, the woods were looking their best, and we both felt particularly vigorous. It was a most enjoyable walk. After reaching the beginning of the long water, we struck away to the right down a woodland glade until we came obliquely to the other water close to the building, which we rightly concluded to be the Grand Trianon. We left it on our left hand and came up to a broad green drive perfectly deserted. If we had followed it, we should have come immediately to the Petit Trianon, but not knowing that, we crossed the drive and went up a lane in front of us. I was surprised that Miss Lamont did not ask the way from a woman who was shaking a white cloth out of the window of a building at the corner of the lane, but followed, supposing that she knew where she was going. Talking about England and mutual acquaintances there, we went up the lane and then made a sharp turn to the right past some buildings. We looked in at an open doorway and saw the end of a carved staircase, but as no one was about, we did not like to go in. There were three paths in front of us, and as we saw two men a little head on the center one, we followed it and asked them the way. Afterwards we spoke of them as gardeners, because we remembered a wheelbarrow of some kind close by and the look of a pointed spade. But they were really very dignified officials, dressed in long grayish-green coats with small three-cornered hats. They directed us straight on. We walked briskly forward, talking as before, but from the moment we left the lane an extraordinary depression had come over me, which, in spite of every effort to shake off, steadily deepened. There seemed to be absolutely no cause for it. I was not at all tired and was becoming more interested in my surroundings. I was anxious that my companion should not discover the sudden gloom upon my spirits, which became quite overpowering on reaching the point where the path ended, being crossed by another right and left. In front of us was a wood, within which, and overshadowed by trees, was a light garden kiosk, circular and like a small bandstand, by which a man was sitting. There was no green sward, but the ground was covered with rough grass and dead leaves as in a wood. The place was so shut in that we could not see beyond it. Everything suddenly looked unnatural, therefore unpleasant. Even the trees behind the building seemed to have become flat and lifeless, like a wood worked on tapestry. There were no effects of light and shade, and no wind stirred the trees. It was all intensely still. The man sitting close to the kiosk, who had on a cloak and a large shady hat, turned his head and looked at us. That was the culmination of my peculiar sensations, and I felt a moment of genuine alarm. The man's face was most repulsive, its expression odious. His complexion was very dark and rough. I said to Miss Lamont, which is our way? but thought, nothing will induce me to go to the left. It was a great relief at that moment to hear someone running up to us in breathless haste. Connecting the sound with the garden officials, I turned and ascertained there was no one on the paths, either behind or to the side, but at almost the same moment I suddenly perceived another man quite close to us, behind and rather to the left hand, who had apparently just come either over or through the rock, or whatever it was, that shut out the view at the junction of the paths. The suddenness of his appearance was something of a shock. The second man was distinctly a gentleman. He was tall with large dark eyes and had crisp curling black hair under the same large sombrero hat. He was handsome, and the effect of the hair was to make him look like an old picture. 
His face was glowing red as through great exertion, as though he had come a long way. At first I thought he was sunburnt, but a second look satisfied me that it was heat, not sunburning. He had on a dark cloak, wrapped across him like a scarf, one end flying out in his prodigious hurry. He looked greatly excited as he called out to us, Madame, Madame, or Madame, pronounced more as the other, Il ne faut, pronounced fou, pas passer par là. He then waved his arm and said with great animation, Par ici, cherchez la maison. I was so surprised at his eagerness that I looked up at him again, to which he responded with a little backward movement and a most peculiar smile. Though I could not follow all he said, it was clear that he was determined that we should go to the right and not to the left. As this fell in with my own wish, I went instantly towards a little bridge on the right, and turning my head to join Miss Lamont in thanking him, found to my surprise that he was not there, but the running began again, and from the sound it was close beside us. Silently we passed over the small rustic bridge which crossed a tiny ravine, so close to us when on the bridge that we could have touched it with our right hands, a thread-like cascade fell from a height down a green pretty bank where ferns grew between stones. Where the little trickle of water went to I did not see, but it gave me the impression that we were near other water, though I saw none. Beyond the little bridge our pathway led under trees. It skirted a narrow meadow of long grass, bounded on the further side by trees, and very much overshadowed by trees growing on it. This gave the whole place a somber look suggestive of dampness, and shut out the view of the house until we were close to it. The house was a square, solidly built country house, quite different from what I expected. The long windows looking north into the English garden, where we were, were shuttered. There was a terrace round the north and west sides of the house, and on the rough grass which grew quite up to the terrace, and with her back to it, a lady was sitting, holding out a paper as though to look at it at arm's length. I supposed her to be sketching, and to have brought her own camp stool. It seemed as though she must be making a study of trees, for they grew close in front of her, and there seemed to be nothing else to sketch. She saw us, and when we passed close by on her left hand, she turned and looked full at us. It was not a young face, and, though rather pretty, it did not attract me. She had on a shady white hat, perched on a good deal of fair hair that fluffed round her forehead. Her light summer dress was arranged on her shoulders in handkerchief fashion, and there was a little line of either green or gold near the edge of the handkerchief, which showed me that it was over, not tucked into her bodice, which was cut low. Her dress was long-waisted, with a good deal of fullness in the skirt, which seemed to be short. I thought she was a tourist, but that her dress was old-fashioned and rather unusual, though people were wearing fichu bodices that summer. I looked straight at her, but some indescribable feeling caused me to turn away, annoyed at her being there. We went up the steps onto the terrace, my impression being that they led up direct from the English garden, but I was beginning to feel as though we were walking in a dream. The stillness and oppressiveness were so unnatural. Again I saw the lady, this time from behind, and noticed that her fichu was pale green. It was rather a relief to me that Miss Lamont did not propose to ask her whether we could enter the house from that side. We crossed the terrace to the southwest corner and looked over into the courtyard and then turned back, and seeing that one of the long windows overlooking the French garden was unshuttered, we were going towards it when we were interrupted. The terrace was prolonged at right angles in front of what seemed to be a second house. The door of it suddenly opened, and a young man stepped out onto the terrace, banging the door behind him. He had the jaunty manner of a footman, but no livery, and called to us saying that the way into the house was by the courtyard and offered to show us the way round. He looked inquisitively amused as he walked by us down the French garden till we came to an entrance into the front drive. We came out so near the first lane we had been in that I wondered why the garden officials had not directed us back instead of telling us to go forward. When we were in the front entrance hall, we were kept waiting for the arrival of a merry French wedding party. They walked arm in arm in a long procession round the rooms, and we were at the back, too far off from the guide to hear much of his story. We were very much interested and felt quite lively again. Coming out of the courtyard, we took a little carriage which was standing there and drove back to the Hôtel des Réservoirs in Versailles, where we had tea. 
but we were neither of us inclined to talk and did not mention any of the events of the afternoon. After tea, we walked back to the station, looking on the way for the tennis court. For a whole week, we never alluded to that afternoon, nor did I think about it until I began writing a descriptive letter of our expeditions of the week before. As the scenes came back one by one, the same sensation of dreary, unnatural oppression came over me so strangely that I stopped writing and said to Miss Lamont, Do you think that the Petit Trianon is haunted? Her answer was prompt. Yes, I do. I asked her where she felt it, and she said, In the garden where we met the two men, but not only there. She then described her feeling of depression and anxiety, which began at the same point as it did with me, and how she tried not to let me know it. Talking it over, we fully realized for the first time the theatrical appearance of the man who spoke to us, the inappropriateness of the wrapped cloak on a warm summer afternoon, the unaccountableness of his coming and going, the excited running which seemed to begin and end close to us and yet always out of sight, and the extreme earnestness with which he desired us to go one way and not another. I said that the thought had come into my mind that the two men were going to fight a duel, and that they were waiting until we were gone. Miss Lamont owned to disliking the thought of passing the man of the kiosk. We did not speak again of the incident during my stay in Paris, though we visited the conciergerie prisons and the tombs of Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette at Saint-Denis, where all was clear and fresh and natural. Three months later, Miss Lamont came to stay with me, and on Sunday, November 10, 1901, we returned to the subject, and I said, if we had known that a lady was sitting so near us sketching, it would have made all the difference, for we should have asked her the way. She replied that she had seen no lady. I reminded her of the person sitting under the terrace, but Miss Lamont declared that there was no one there. I exclaimed that it was impossible that she should not have seen the individual, for we were walking side by side and walked straight up to her, past her, and looked down upon her from the terrace. It was inconceivable to us both that my companion should not have seen the lady, but the fact was quite certain that Miss Lamont had not done so, though we had both been rather on the lookout for someone who would reassure us as to whether we were trespassing or not. Finding that we had a new element of mystery, and doubting how far we had seen any of the same things, we resolved to write down independent accounts of our expedition to Trianon, read up its history, and make every inquiry about the place. Miss Lamont returned to her school the same evening, and two days later I received from her a very interesting letter giving the result of her first inquiries. November 1901. B2. Miss Lamont's account of the same expedition in 1901. After spending some time in the palace, we went down by the terraces and struck to the right to find the Petit Trianon. We walked for some distance down a wooded alley and then came upon the buildings of the Grand Trianon, before which we did not delay. We went on in the direction of the Petit Trianon, but just before reaching what we knew afterwards to be the main entrance, I saw a gate leading to a path cut deep below the level of the ground above, and as the way was open and had the look of an entrance that was used, I said, Shall we try this path? It must lead to the house, and we followed it. To our right, we saw some farm buildings looking empty and deserted. Implements were lying about. We looked in but saw no one. The depression was saddening, but it was not until we reached the crest of the rising ground where was a garden that I began to feel as if we had lost our way and as if something were wrong. There were two men there in official dress, greenish in color, with something in their hands. It might have been a staff. A wheelbarrow and some other gardening tools were near them. They told us in answer to my inquiry to go straight on. I remember repeating my question because they answered in a seemingly casual and mechanical way, but only got the same answer in the same manner. As we were standing there, I saw to the right of us a detached, solidly built cottage with stone steps at the door. A woman and a girl were standing at the doorway, and I particularly noticed their unusual dress. Both wore white kerchiefs tucked into the bodice, and the girl's dress, though she looked thirteen or fourteen only, was down to her ankles. The woman was passing a jug to the girl, who wore a close white cap. Following the directions of the two men, we walked on, but the path pointed out to us seemed to lead away from where we imagined the Petit Trianon to be, and there was a feeling of depression and loneliness about the place. I began to feel as if I were walking in my sleep. The heavy dreaminess was oppressive. 
At last we came upon a path crossing ours, and saw in front of us a building consisting of some columns roofed in and set back in the trees. Seated on the steps was a man with a heavy black cloak round his shoulders and wearing a slouch hat. At that moment the eerie feeling which had begun in the garden culminated in a definite impression of something uncanny and fear-inspiring. The man slowly turned his face, which was marked by smallpox. His complexion was very dark. The expression was very evil and yet unseeing, and though I did not feel that he was looking particularly at us, I felt a repugnance to going past him. But I did not wish to show the feeling, which I thought was meaningless, and we talked about the best way to turn and decided to go the right. Suddenly we heard a man running behind us. He shouted, Mesdames, Mesdames, and when I turned, he said in an accent that seemed to me unusual that our way lay in another direction. Il ne faut, pronounced fou, pas passer par là. He then made a gesture, adding, Par ici, cherchez la maison. Though we were surprised to be addressed, we were glad of the direction and thanked him. The man ran off with a curious smile on his face. The running ceased as abruptly as it had begun, not far from where we stood. I remember that the man was young-looking, with a florid complexion and rather long dark hair. I do not remember the dress except that the material was dark and heavy. We walked on, crossing a small bridge that went across a green bank, high on our right hand, and shelving down below us to a very small, overshadowed pool of water glimmering some way off. A tiny stream descended from above us, so small as to seem to lose itself before reaching the little pool. We then followed a narrow path till almost immediately we came upon the English garden front of the Petit Trianon. The place was deserted, but as we approached the terrace, I remember drawing my skirt away with a feeling as though someone were near and I had to make room, and then wondering why I did it. While we were on the terrace, a boy came out of the door of a second building which opened on it, and I still have the sound in my ears of his slamming it behind him. He directed us to go round to the other entrance, and seeing us hesitate, with a peculiar smile of suppressed mockery, offered to show us the way. We passed through the French garden, part of which was walled in by trees. The feeling of dreariness was very strong there, and continued till we actually reached the front entrance to the Petit Trianon and looked round the rooms in the wake of a French wedding party. Afterwards we drove back to the Rue des Reservoirs. The impression returned to me at intervals during the week that followed, but I did not speak of it until Miss Morrison asked me if I thought the Petit Trianon was haunted, and I said yes. Then, too, the inconsistency of the dress and behavior of the men with an August afternoon at Versailles struck me. We had only this one conversation about the two men. Nothing else passed between us in Paris. It was not until three months later, when I was staying at blank, that Miss Morrison casually mentioned the lady and almost refused to believe that I had not seen her. How that happened was quite inexplicable to me, for I believed myself to be looking about on all sides, and it was not so much that I could not remember her as that I could have said no one was there. But as she said it, I remembered my impression at the moment of there being more people than I could see, though I did not tell her this. The same evening, November 18, 1901, I returned to blank. Curiously enough, the next morning, I had to give one of a set of lessons on the French Revolution for the higher certificate, and it struck me for the first time with great interest that the 10th of August had a special significance in French history, and that we had been at Trianon on the anniversary of the day. That evening, when I was preparing to write down my experiences, Mademoiselle Blank, whose home was in Paris, came into my room, and I asked her, just on the chance, if she knew any story about the haunting of the Petit Trianon. I had not mentioned our story to her before, nor indeed to anyone. She said directly that she remembered hearing from her friends, the blank, at Versailles, that on a certain day in August, Marie Antoinette is regularly seen sitting outside the garden front at the Petit Trianon, with a light flapping hat and a pink dress. More than this, that the place, especially the farm, the garden, and the path by the water, are peopled with those who used to be with her there. In fact, that all the occupations and amusements reproduce themselves there for a day and a night. I then told her our story, and when I quoted the words that the man spoke to us, and imitated as well as I could his accent, she immediately said that it was the Austrian pronunciation of French. I had privately thought that he spoke Old French. Immediately afterwards I wrote and told this to Miss Morrison. December 1901 End of section 5, read by Martha Weller, Champaign, Illinois, May 21st, 2023. End of an adventure by Charlotte Ann Elizabeth Moberly, 
and Eleanor Jourdain.